All right, so let's call the meeting to order. And I'd, I'd ask to begin with a moment of silence and reflection on the, and contemplation of what the Ukraine is going through. If you could all please, for those of you who can please stand to join me in a moment of reflection and solidarity for the Ukrainian people in the Ukrainian country and a prayer, a you know, moment of contemplation, whatever you can do to send to um, send some positive energy uh, and thought to the Ukrainian people here and abroad that the aggression and the war uh, by Russia ends. Thank you. All right. Good morning. We are at a remote meeting that's being broadcast by NORCAM, maybe being broadcast by others. We are also broadcasting by Zoom. We are also um, joined remotely by uh, some of the members of our finance committee, and I, I just saw Chief Staff stand up, so can we begin with a moment of uh, Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> so, sorry about that, folks. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Chief. Okay. We're joined by my colleagues on the select board, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mrs. Mandy Pelly. We're joined by the members of the Finance Committee, Matt Davis, Don Kelleher, Don Pulver, Abigail Hurlbert, Dan Mills, and Richard Johnson. That's everyone, Mr. Okay. So we will begin. Our first order of business is pub. Oh, Please. I have the wrong agenda. I almost said public comment. <laughs> Please. Our first order of business is we are here today for the budget presentation from our public safety. We're joined by our public safety direct director and chief of police, Chief Murphy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair. Through you, just by way of a, a very brief introduction, um, you know, after some discussion uh, during a select board meeting, I think at the end of January, we provided guidelines to the um, department heads to abbreviate their presentations and really just stress the uh, the issues and the needs facing um, their particular department. So, while many of the slides you'll see will look familiar, there are likely fewer than you saw when we were last assembled in this room two years ago in person. Um, and that, that's sort of aimed at trying to focus the conversation about uh, particular issues and needs in departments, which vary from department by department. So if you see a, a little bit less information on the slides, I would just remind everyone um, there is a very lengthy budget document that the finance director has provided to all of us, and it includes a, a number of different pieces of backup information from the departments as well um, that I know many of you have reviewed or will review in the coming weeks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And do you got to turn it over to the police chief? Thank you, Mr. Bill um, thank you very much. I did get the memo, so the presentation is a lot shorter than it's been in the past. Um, I did previously submit a 102-page document um, that hopefully everybody got a chance to look at, um, and then certainly answer any questions that you have from that document. Um, that document um, is a lot of work that gets put in each year um, for that, um, as well as you know we have a five to ten year um, budget plan in place. Um, my administrative staff isn't here with me today. Um, I thought that having a shorter presentation would just be um, difficult to have everybody here because I know that um, it tends to extend the budget presentation. But um, they put a lot of work into this, and I just want to acknowledge their work in, in, in many members of the department that I'm here with me today. Um, it's not all on me, um, but 
this presentation in, in our budget itself is, is a very important document for us. It's probably the most important statement I can make as a police chief because it takes all of, um, without the budget, we can't operate. And it, it, it establishes for us um, equipment levels, training levels, and uh, allocation of resources so that we can fulfill um, the public safety needs of the community. Um, and it kind of translates our goals and objectives um, into reality. So um, I thank the board and, and the finance committee and the community for support over the years. Um, you know, we've, we've come a long way um, with technology and um, with training and, um, you know, I hope the end product is, is um, one filled with integrity and professionalism. Um, I'm proud of the offices and, and our, um, the men and women of the police department. So. Um, just want to make sure that it was clear that this is not all on me. Um, our department as a whole um, has put a lot of work in this. So that being said, um, our budget presentation overview. So I'm going to speak a little bit about our grants that we've received um, and that we are going to receive over the uh, fiscal year 23. I'll go over our budget statement. Uh, I'll give an update on our fleet. Um, and I'll also talk about our goals and objectives um, in FY23. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about our previous goals. I think, um, you know, the town minister has asked us to really focus on what the needs of the department are going forward rather than, um, you know, speaking about what's happened in the past. <coughs> so just a brief overview on our grants. Um, we, we, as the police department, operate the 911 um, call center and um, the fire department has the secondary call center which we transfer all medical and fire related calls to them. So the nine, state 911 provides um, a training grant and an incentive grant. The training grant um, self-explanatory trains all the officers and firefighters to be able to handle all the various types of calls that we're receiving. We're, we're at this point um, not just getting phone calls, we're getting um, text 911 calls, we're getting video 911 calls, so it's, you know, it's expanded over the years and um, so this provides that training annually for our uh, officers and firefighters, um, um, not the firefighters on that particular one, but they are um, they're trained specifically on EMD, which is the Emergency Medical Dispatch. Uh, the incentive grant provides a lot of the um, uh, technology um, to, um, to kind of support the 911 grant, so it's they do pay for a lot of the mobile data terminals that we have in the patrol unit, so there is um, some good value um, out of operating the 911 system. Uh, we have a potential grant for our body cameras, um, which we're looking to implement over the next year. Um, they, we've received um, a tentative agreement from the Executive Office of Public Safety for just over $100,000 to um, cover the purchase of 35 body cameras and on-site storage for one year. So there'll be no cost to the town for the initial setup. Um, we do have to um, meet some criteria in order to, um, to actually receive the funds, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're gonna get there, um, hopefully by um, July 1st. And uh, this is the year we, we, every five years, our offices get um, new ballistic vests and um, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, pays for that through a grant. So, we're up, uh, we'll receive about $20,000 for that this year. Um, and as probably everybody knows, we received an additional five years from our Drug Free Communities Grant. It's $125,000 annually. It covers all of our Drug Free Community Grant Coordinators, um, our Director's Salary Benefits. And um, that will be for the next five years. So. Um, you know, with our costs are covered there and after year 10, um, you know, the town can make a decision from there whether they are going to you know, the program. I can tell you it's been very successful. Um, one of the um, documents that I handed out um, was that uh, our coalition was actually um, spotlighted through the um, EFC program. Um, they, we have our mental health coordinator, our drug-free communities director, and the police department working together on a daily basis. Um, you would think that at this time it's probably the norm that police departments in, in the community work together, but um, they spotted us, spotlighted us as one of um, kind of like the outliers. It, it doesn't happen in a lot of communities, so um, they're urging other coalitions to adopt um, that same type of a model. So, you know, it's a pretty 
um, detailed um, you know, overview of us, and we went through a process. We really spoke to the town administrator and myself, finance instructor, so um, they, they got a good picture of where our, our community stands um, with this grant. So I think this that was helpful as well of us obtaining um, the grant again for the, for the next five years. And, and I know everybody knows Amy Luckwitz, who's our director, she does a tremendous job, um, you know, working with the schools. Um, the relations have gotten um, a lot better over the last couple of years, and it's not that, um, when I say relationship, I think they're allotting more time to us. They have time constraints on what they have to accomplish, so you know, time is very difficult, but um, they're making that extra time now, which I think is very important um, as we try to prevent drug use um, from occurring with our youth. So my budget statement for this year, we are um, asking for an increase of $12,711. You can see it's a 0.3% from our appropriated FY22 budget. Um, see, these are some of the um, increases and decreases that um, we, I guess, the, I, I describe this as our big money items and our big savings items, because there's obviously some here and there that we've um, spent a, a, a small percentage more or less. So um, contractual increases, um, upcoming years, step raises, um, you know, different contractual increases are about $37,000 um, increase this year. Um, we have a $14,000 increase in our ammunition for our training. Um, you know, it's, it's the um, supply and demand issue that I think most of our country is seeing with different, um, um, you know, different products throughout. So our, we're getting the same amount of ammunition, it's just $14,000 more this year. Hopefully that cost um, lowers over the next couple of years. Um, our overtime has decreased this year, um, $34,000. Um, I just put the, the difference in our, um, I, I said this last year as well, because we had about a $30,000 decrease last year. Um, I think the, you know, the town working with our police department, our officers, the finance committee, um, we've, we've had reforms over the years that have resulted in these savings. We've seen an increase in our annual um, COLAs every year, but we, you know, from FY13 to where we are today, we're about $60,000 less than over time. So you know, the system is working, and um, you know, thank the board, the, the um, finance committee, finance director, town administrator, and our offices for working to um, you know, so that we can sustain our department going forward and don't have to come in asking for a significant increase each year. This is just a budget comparison. It's in your packet, but I just wanted to give you an idea of where we um, are as far as payroll goes, what we're looking for for expenditures. Um, I'll talk about our small capital when we get to our fleet and uh, that total budget again is an increase, uh, requested increase of about $13,000. So our fleet management, so our, our whole fleet is out of warranty at this point. Um, we work to try to get at least have half the fleet um, under warranty so that we're not you know, in, um, incurring significant costs um, I think it was FY21, we didn't get any cruises, so um, put us behind the eight ball a little bit, but we were able to, to manage that. Um, but our, our FY22 cruises have been on order since July 1. Um, they, they're telling us that we can expect delivery around June. So that puts us back essentially a, a year. Um, we're trying to manage the cost associated with that. Our average um, mileage right now is about 65,000. Uh, when you add in the um, hours of idling and whatnot, it, it's in the $80,000 range. Um, but we're still in good shape. Um, I think the technology's come a long way. Um, and um, we're looking to um, add two additional um, cruises for FY23, which would put us back into the half 50% being under warranty, which will lessen our maintenance costs um, for anyone. These are the hybrids as well. Um, I think it's a $2,000 difference from last year, less than, than um, our FY22. Um, and that 
more of the emergency upfitting, um, we're able to transfer some of the equipment over to the new crews. <coughs> so our FY23 goals and objectives, um, we have several that are pretty major. Um, department head transition is um, retirement in my position um, in FY23, um, in August of 23. So um, I've been working with the town administrator and the human resource director um, to come up with a process to prepare for that. Um, and we will continue to work over um, the next year to make sure that the process um, goes smoothly. And in addition to that, um, we analyze our department personnel um, annually. So this is this goal is more of preparing them for the future. So we've had some leadership changes over the last couple of years. We had two sides retire last year. Um, and our goal is to continue to develop our offices so that they can send to these positions. Um, I don't want to say we're all old, but we're getting older. And um, the um, I think it's very important for us to continue to develop um, the, the younger offices in the department so that there's a smooth transition in um, in leadership positions. And so far, it's, it's been occurring. We've required some um, good replacement sergeants um, for um, our two sergeants that retired, so we're, we're in good shape leadership-wise. Our recruitment and training, um, one of the things we've noticed over the last couple of years, and it's not just the town of North Reading, it's police in general, um, having trouble recruiting people to, um, to the job. Uh, we have had three entrance exams over the last six years. Our first exam, we've had over 160 people take the test. Our second exam, we were down to 80. And this last exam, we were under 60. Um, and as far as North Reading residents go, we had um, very few North Reading residents um, applying for our positions. So we're looking to um, work with colleges and try to market our department a little bit better um, so that we could um, recruit. Um, but we are in competition with a lot of other departments. So uh, we have to come up with a better plan to, to recruit and not only recruit but retain employees. Uh, I think that's important um, you know, with um, scrutiny on law enforcement. Um, the, it's a very difficult job um, of ours to continue to maintain employees. Um, we've had a few that have, have resigned um, over the years that they just don't want to be in law enforcement anymore. So we just have to do a, uh, come up with a good plan um, so that we can continue to um, provide the services to the community. And this year we are going, um, we are going to be reassessed for accreditation. Um, we've been accredited since 2011. And um, the process essentially, um, we have policies and procedures, um, equipment that essentially gets assessed by assessors and um, we have to maintain a certain amount of, of um, standards. And um, then there are additional standards that we can do as, as optional. So we, We've always met the standards and we try to exceed the uh, optional standards. Um, speaking a little bit about police reform, I think our accreditation system that we have in place, we've been ahead of the curve. We haven't had to make many changes um, in the department because of us being accredited. So um, you know, I, I always feel that accreditation you know, does limit our liabilities, makes us more professional. and. Um, you know, it's something that I think that the department should never look back on. We're going to continue to strive to be accredited um, in the future. Um, one of, speaking of the police reform again, you know, we, we've always trained de-escalation, um, but I think it's, it's so much more important now. Um, we're actually required to de-escalate as, as, um, as safely as possible um, with we, you know, we have an increase in our mental health um, calls as well, um, and you know, use of force is not a good option when you're dealing with people that have mental illnesses. We try to have our offices trained in de-escalation so that they can get the skills necessary to have a safe outcome. You know, these calls are, are becoming, I guess, more you know, 
you know, lengthier than they used to be um, because we're trying to just make sure that it's, it's resolved as safely as possible. Um, conflict resolution for policing now, um, you know, we get challenged a lot more than we used to, um, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're most likely brought to the situation by somebody's complaint or, um, you know, there's a conflict resolution that needs to be done. So, um, you know, we're just trying to get better at de-escalation because at the end of the day, um, we just want to resolve the issue and I think, you know, everybody wants it done safely. So, de-escalation training, and I know it's the buzzword out there, but you know, we've been doing it for a long time, Massachusetts in general. And um, you know, we, we're gonna just strive to, to do more and more um, of that over the next year. And you know, this has been on here since I've become chief. You know, our continued efforts to minimize the impact of illicit drugs, and we've done that by adding um, our drug free communities coordinator working with our schools. Um, you know, prevention is our number one priority, not, not prosecution. We continue to do that. We, we have seen the successes of it. Um, we still have um, you know, overdose, overdoses occurring, um, but they're less frequent than they were in the past. Um, we've had four overdose deaths over the last year. Um, it's not a good number. Obviously, we, we try to strive for zero, and, um, but you know, we keep working on it, and I think it's just, you know, this is part of, of what we're it's ingrained in our department and we'll continue to work towards uh, making sure that um, you know everybody has the referral services they need and any help that they need. <clears throat> so I added this in, you know, I, our uh, Drug Free Communities Director had um, pages and pages of objectives as she's very um, goal oriented and, uh, but I wanted to make sure that it was included here. It is in your packet. I thought, you know, for the public to see it as well. Um, they do work very closely with our officers, um, with, where, whether it's the roll call training or just in general. They're, you know, they're they're always in in, in Amy's office. They're always in Laura's office um, because there are some skills that we're not quite as skilled in as they are. And um, you know, that that partnership has been really um, helpful for all of us to. Um, to get better at, at what we do. Um, so as you can see, she's looking to coordinate with the youth, uh, development of the youth action team, um, 10 more roll calls to inform officers. That's become a, a good uh, a, a good area where, you know, it's just more casual at that point where she can sit down and speak with officers about trends that she's seeing so that they can keep an eye out and refer um, to her or Laura if necessary. Um, and she's continuing to um, coordinate trainings with the middle of high school. It was a little bit difficult over the last year with COVID, but a lot of it was done virtually. There were some um, in person, um, and they're going to continue to do that because I think it's well received in the school as well. And you know, as you know, Amy does the tips compliance checks. Um, I think that program's been working well. Hopefully, the the board, um, when you know, when she does do her reports, um, can see the work that she's putting into it. But I think. You know, having people um, a little bit more accountability, it's, I think it's providing a, a safer environment in the restaurants and liquor stores um, so that they're not, um, you know, violating um, our liquor laws. And uh, um, as you all know, we have a mental health substance abuse clinician. Um, Laura Miranda works full time in our department. Um, you know, we've really strengthen the relationship there as well. Our offices refer a, a significant amount of calls to her, um, but we're not seeing um, the repeat calls for service, the same addresses, which is what the whole reason why, um, you know, we, we essentially have Laura there. We will, you know, we want to be able to refer people to services, but not have to go back because it's not a law enforcement issue. It, you know, it, most likely it's a mental health issue that they need. Um, clinical help on so um, that's really been working well she's also working with our offices on um, their mental health care um, you know the stresses of the job you know, it, it, in, you know when you're in it even myself you know you get stressed and it's not just from 
the calls for service is just is just everything, right? We think you know we're we're the ones that are open 24/7, so you know we feel a lot of it does come to our responsibility. So you know it's important for us to care for you know to understand that it's okay to be stressful and how to deal with it, whether it's through nutrition, exercise, or just talking to people. So she's been working with our offices on that and. and and it's been well received. I know I couldn't do it with, with my officers, but they probably wouldn't want to listen. Um, having somebody that actually um, is trained in this field listening is, is very important. Um, she's also um, looking to increase um, the relationship with um, veterans and youth services. Um, it's been a work in progress. It's, um, she, Laura's been here for three years, two of which have been COVID years. So i um, looking to get back to developing those as well. Um, and she's, she's had some, um, she calls virtual self-care um, seminars, which have been held at the library. Um, there's um, some information up on the town website about um, some of the upcoming um, trainings and or um, seminars that she's having. So if anybody wanted to, any more information, they can contact Laura or we'll go on the town's website. And just as a summary um, of our budget proposal, um, again, our, you know, the document that I submitted um, is very lengthy and it's very detailed. Um, we provide um, support document for all of, 90% um, of what we're requesting. Um, we provide quotes, we provide um, hopefully a detailed explanation for everybody so it's self-explanatory. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's something that you know, we, we really strive to not only prepare the budget, but to make sure we're, we stay within the budget. And we've been successful over the last 10 years of doing that. So I think you know, this budget that I presented today um, and, and the written document that I've provided will provide us the best means of, of providing the best possible public safety to the town of Red. So I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I was just curious, you were saying you were, um, had a very low um, applicants coming into the town. Is that kind of statewide? Is that? Yes. Yes. So it's kind of across the board. And yes. Yes. So I, you know, I, I'm on email distribution lists and, and daily I get um, lateral transfer requests, essentially departments looking for officers to transfer to their departments. So it, it, it happens every single Everybody's day. Feeling Everybody's that. feeling that. Um, you know, from the state on down, it's just, um, you know, I don't, I don't, we don't, nobody really knows why. Um, I mean, we can all surmise why, but, um, you know, I don't know that that's the end all be all. It just, you know, there's, there's other opportunities and, and, you know, different priorities for people. Um, but, you know, it, it'll, it'll come around again, I think. Um, and, um, we're just having, you know, I think having a, uh, you know, the support of the community is just so important when, when it does come for us to recruit the personnel. So um, I'm confident we have good candidates. <coughs> Don't get me wrong. The, out of the 60 that we have, we have very good candidates. Um, but it does cause for concern is, is does that number go low? Because we've seen the trend over the last three years. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. And just a comment. Um, as liaison on to the CIT, I see a lot of what goes on there, and, and I just can't say enough about it. It's a great program. It all works well together, so thank you. Thank you. I think the volunteers that we have um, drive a lot of it, and um, you know, we kind of set the foundation for it, but the, you know, the, the, the volunteers and, and, and a lot of the um, um, department heads that are on these committees really, really work hard to make sure that we're trying to lessen the impact of, of anything that's you know, hitting our quality of life. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Mr. Just the, so obviously you think the staffing level is adequate. Yes. You know, it just, just you don't see in, in, in your five, ten year plan, do you see a need for expansion of personnel? Um, so the only thing that I would say is, is, you know, a few years ago when we started talking about dispatch, um, we, our safety officer right now works the overnights. And, you know, having, there's a lot of um, need for his, his involvement 
with the town and during the planning process. Um, so when we spoke about dispatch having, if we would go to civilian dispatch at some point, it's going to actually free up more offices. If we're going to have, um, you know, a, 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 a sergeant's not going to be tied to the desk, so he's going to have the opportunity to be out on the road as well. So it's like multiplying the department right away. We would add one person to every shift, and then we would be able to actually be able to increase our detective division and our um, safety, full-time safety officer, all within the same footprint we have now. I, we're at 32 offices. I don't see the need for, for more offices at this point. I don't see the, the need now or in 10 years from now. But things change. Yeah. But right now, I don't <coughs> forecast that that's a need at all. And, uh, and again, I, you know, it's unbelievable that you're coming in here just looking for an increase of twelve thousand, thirteen thousand yeah. dollars. It's unheard of, and, and that includes, you know, cost of living increases, everything else that, that goes along with the contractual ob obligations and the uh, efforts that you put forth to, to meet the public safety needs. It's phenomenal, you know. So to you and your command staff and administrative staff and everybody. It's amazing how you're doing it and how you're managing it. And, you know, Thank you, We sir. all appreciate it. And, uh, I'm sure the other departments appreciate it too because their costs are escalating <laughs> far more, far, far greater rate. Um, but you know, you do a terrific job. Uh, the department is well respected and uh, it's not an easy job. And, uh, again, greatly appreciate it. Uh, the effort that's put in just in the budget stuff, but for what they do every day. Thank you. Just to clarify, so our uh, one of our both of our contracts were are expiring this year, but the contractual increases are based upon not calls but um, other you know, they, yeah, they reforms and everything. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, second, Mr. O'Leary. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Goldberg. I I do have questions, but I just want to make sure we get through all the select board and finance committee members. So when I ask anyone has questions, that's everyone. Any, anyone on finance and anyone who is attending remotely, if they have questions. Ms. Mr. Paul. Uh, yes, Chief, about the body camera grant. Yes. Um, do we already have body cameras or a policy? So we have a proposed policy in place which has to be submitted to um, the Executive Office of Public Safety. And we also need an agreement with the union, which we are pretty confident. Um, we have one union that's already agreed and we're pretty confident the other. Um, you know, they, we're working with them now, so um, we don't have the money yet for the body cameras, but we're working with vendors, so we're we're ready to turn key into July if, if it all works out. You know, there will be a, probably a pilot program. Um, there's some training that needs to be done. Um, but our goal is to have every officer wearing the body camera while they're in the zone. And a follow-up, um, this is the one year storage is that cloud or is that owned you know so is that rental or or, or so owned? yeah so you know that's the most difficult part with the grant itself we've had um so the grant will pay for storage but we don't know how much storage we're going to need because we don't know um the, the secretary of state's public records law i don't think it weighed in on what we need to keep and how long we need to keep it for so that's going to be a challenge um, the grant will not pay for cloud storage um, which, you know, for, for us, it, is, it makes it difficult because we would rather go to cloud storage. Mm -hmm. um, but there are programs that are out there that are just monthly fee-based mm -hmm. that we could pay, which I think would be less than than our annual cost to have it stored. And yeah, right. That, where I was going was this, this has become an ongoing expense for storage, even though you get in with a grant, it might become an ongoing future expense. Yes. Yes. It, it, yeah. In FY23, it will not, but yes, certainly, I think going forward, it would, there's going to be a cost associated. Cameras are fairly cheap. Um, mm -hmm. When I say cheap, I don't mean they're cheaply made. They're inexpensive because I think the vendors are looking for the storage. That's what they want to do. Um, so, but I think that cost will come down too once more and more there's competition for it. Mm -hmm. I think the cost, that cost will be driven down as well. We have to back everything up as well. It's not just yep. the storage. We have to back up that storage. Um, you know, if we have, um, you know, if there's a case that we have to produce the, um, the footage on, you know, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of discovery that has to happen. So it's not, you know, it's not that we're just going to put the cameras on and roll with it. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but it's something that we think that brings value to the community, you know, and, and you know, we can, we'll, 
we can, when I say deal with it, it's not going to cost the town anymore for our department to process, open the process. Thank you. Sure. Is that, Mr. Fowler? Any other questions? Excuse me, just in relation to the storage costs, I forget what the number was, is it $70,000 approximately that we can anticipate after the grant money's run out? So I don't, I don't, if we, that's in a high drive storage. So they, right. we were kind of forced in a way to, to do that. I mean, we can certainly go on our own and there are other programs that are out there that are a per officer cost basis and we're averaging that out to be about 30,000 a year if we go that route. Right. But if you do a higher storage, that's, it, it, you know, it, I don't know the exact um, memory that we need, but um, it's, it's that in and of itself was $70,000. Yeah. So I think it's kind of wasteful money for the state to do that, but that's just the problem they came up with. I think, you know, if they were to allow us to do the storage base, uh, the cloud base, um, I think we'd probably get two to three years out of that $70,000. But right. we're, we're, that's not an option at this point. But we'll work on it. Two to three years would be, you know, almost consistent. It would be consistent. Three would be consistent with the municipal retention schedule. So you probably, that's probably your, you know, measuring stick in terms of what you have to say with tower and dispatch tapes anyway. You know, you go to a call for service with a body camera on and, you know, just a, a, whether it's an alarm call, right? You go to an alarm call, you turn the body camera on and it's just the wind, whatever the case is. That's what we have to work out. We have to save that as well. You know, that doesn't, you know, what, what's the, you know, what's the value in that? But if it's a public record, it's a public record. So we have to work that through that. And I think that's what the Secretary of State's doing as well, is trying to work through all of that. What's actually required to be saved? Probably going to be at least a three-year period of storage. Sure. So tax to limitation periods and everything else like that. Mr. O'Leary, any other questions no, on I'm that piece? No, good, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to check Mr. Gilberto to make sure our, our uh, finance committee members join in online. Do they have any questions? I'm not seeing any, no. Okay. Any other questions from the board members? All set? Just a comment and you're done. Uh, All right. I do have a few questions for you. Uh, the first is, would you be able to um, would you have be able to do the level of substance use intervention that you're doing now without that grant, that hundred and twenty five thousand dollar grant? No. And that's um, something that if we after this five years lose that grant, that's something as the public safety director you would want us to <coughs> fit into our budget to to maintain that. Yeah, as part of my notes, which I didn't read, I, I, you know, I, I think it is very important for us to continue that. And, and I think I said it last year when we were, we had known that we were going to get the grant, and that, that we as a town on the police and the town administrators had planned for it. Um, I think the cost was a lot less. It was you know, in the $95,000 range. Um, because there would be a lot less travel involved, you know, the, our coalition, they go to um, um, different conferences throughout in, in, the, in the country and the grant pays for that. So a lot of that wouldn't be needed, but the person would be needed and also the, um, um, you know, some of the supplies that she has for, for doing the trains and schools and things like that. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, the town, I won't say it's here to stay because it's obviously not my decision. It's the you know the, the townspeople's decision. But I think if you look at the value um, versus the, you know what, you know, so it's, I think the drug problem is always going to be. And I think it's, it, it continues. There's more and more exposure to different types of drugs. So um, you know it's going to evolve over time. But I, I don't think that that would um, be a good move to not support. It. I was just thinking in terms of some long-term financial planning potentially if that if we need to we know that's not going away and my um, second question relates to your overtime reduction and I know your answer was that it was due to reforms um, is 
any portion of that due to maybe a lessening of calls during COVID and that we might be seeing an increase in that maybe as things you know open up more and people go out more and things like that? I think you'll see a slight increase in court time. So courts were closed and we're to we they've essentially um, essentially kicked the jury trials down the road. And um, so I think you may see a slight increase there. So it's reforms, but it's also we have um, so we had two sergeants that retired that were on for you know close to thirty years. And they had full vacation time. So there's a reduction in that as oh. well. So I think what you're seeing is is, is the older guys start to retire, they, they're losing some of the, the benefits that the, the um, new hires are not going to get. So there's the, there's the reform savings, um, but then there's also the savings of, of um, compensatory time off. <coughs> Plus they're coming in at a, at a salary that's a lot less than the person that just retired. So. I don't see the like overtime next year being increased all that much, um, but I, I don't know. But I just you know based upon the trends and based upon any contractual settlements, that's probably what's going to drive it up. But as far as calls for service, um, we don't call people in when we get more calls for service. You know, if there's a uh, a critical incident, you know that that may cause us to call people in for overtime, but we plan for that as well. That's in our emergency overtime. So I don't think calls for service drive the overtime at all. Right. And they haven't in the last, in, you know, my tenure as chief, so I don't see that being an issue. Do you have a sense of, of the number of calls that you do respond to? I remember you told us a percentage before. Yes. But do you have a sense of, and I'm putting you on the spot, if you don't have it, that's okay. Do you have a sense of how many of your calls that your <coughs> staff is responding to have a substance use component to them? Yeah, I, I don't know the actual percentage, but um, we, we respond to a lot of overdoses. And, you know, those, you know, even, so some of them are, are fatal and some of them aren't, um, but we try to follow up. So there's a lot of time that's consumed on it. Um, and I do have, I actually do have the call, I don't have it with me, but I do have our call breakdown. I would say it's, it's, it's under 10%. So I don't, like if you were to ask me what's our, our most um, frequent cause for service, I would say response to mental health issues at this point. You know, aside from motor vehicle stops and aside from, you know, alarm calls, those are, those are just, I don't want to say routine, but that's what we do every day. But, you know, our calls for service, somebody calling us and asking for assistance, a lot of it is, is mental health issues. And I, I had more of a, a comment on your department's planning for your, or maybe a question, but more of a comment on your department's planning for future recruitment, current and future recruitment, and wondering whether you have, um, because I know there's uh, students in this community who may consider that as a career option. I know there are female students in this community that may consider that as a, as a career option, but I don't know what efforts are being made for future planning to have female officers. It's a whole pool of officers that could be recruited for positions on the police department, many of whom live in the community, that um, I don't know what type of future planning is being done with regard to that type of recruitment. There could be junior cadet programs. I don't know if you have those. It could be. Uh, cadet programs, um, there could be, uh, you know, internship programs and things like that made available to people in the community, students or college students, etc. And I'm wondering if there's any, did that happen, was that in existence and gone? Is that considered? And what is your department doing for any future planning to recruit females to the department who could be, you know, a very efficient law enforcement personnel for for the, the town. Agreed. So, so yes, yes and no. So some of them did exist in the past. We did have internships. Um, we we ran into some problems with internships because of background checks that weren't completed. Um, so it was a very difficult program. 
um, we, we want to do that, but it was just a difficult program because a lot of them would come in and essentially how other clowns were doing it is they would be basically pushing paper. They weren't really learning anything. Um, we've, had, we've had that internship program. I stopped it because of just issues that, that came up during the process that we, I felt were, were um, um, not something we could control. Um, so to speak. A lot of information that was inside the department and outside the department. There's a lot of things that come into play. But that being said, that's what this, my, one of my goals is all about, is to actually come up with a game plan to do that. And I, for the life of me, don't understand why um, we haven't had female applicants. Um, and, and when I say that, we have had some female applicants, um, but there were other qualified people. Um, but we're we're not we're getting very few. We're getting maybe you know five, six, seven people that are taking the exam out of 150 people. And and, and when it comes to North Reading residents, you know they we brought all our North Reading residents <coughs> in for an interview, no matter where they landed on the list. And um, you know, but we're looking for the best qualified person. Um, so that being said, we we are interviewing at this point, and we do have females that we're interviewing. So. Um, you know, we'll see where, where that all takes us. Um, but I agree with you. We, you know, we've had one female in my tenure here. And um, it, it is, there is, um, you know, there's definitely a need for us to, to hire a female. Um, and we're going to continue to work at it. I, I, coming up with this plan is not just going to be, you know, what do you think we're going to do? We're looking to look at best practices. What are other problems are doing? Because now we're in competition with um, we did, um, the school had parent university and we participated in that. We've had, um, we've actually had an academy um, at the department, it's not a cadet academy, but it was, you know, younger kids that were looking to aspire to be police officers. So, um, you know, but we all also speak to a lot of young kids in school too. Um, I've spoken to many um, female high school students that, you know, they just want to come in and talk. So. That's an informal way of doing it, um, but that, that's why I want to formalize something. I want to have a plan in place so that it's not only now, it's, it's going forward. Um, but I do agree with you. We need to more. I think the things like a, a camera that you have to wear is really intrusive in terms of the work that's being done, but I can understand why it's necessary. But I also think that the younger generation already lives its entire life through a camera, so that's something completely, you know, compatible compatible with their lifestyle anyway. But but I also think that, you know, the Middlesex Sheriff's has a great, you know, deputy academy program that they run annually mm -hmm. as a sort of, <coughs> of camp. It is a camp. It's a week long camp. And they're younger so it kind of gets that idea in their mind as a younger individual. And then unfortunately usually you lose that and in you know the later years, but if, if there was a way to keep a program going that then the younger kids could then participate as older kids, and maybe that could be a way to kind of keep the recruitment within the town of gather you know gathering potential candidates within the town, not just males but males and females. Right. No, I, I agree. And like I said, we're um, we will, and I know about that program. We've actually sponsored kids to go to the program. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know if we have that capacity uh, to do something like that, but we can certainly do something on a smaller scale. But it's just developing, I think, that relationship with the high school kids. And our school resource officer does that. Um, so well like there. Yeah, and I think it, it, that's, that's going to be, I, I, you know, he's, our, he's the key to it all, too, because he has the face-to-face the -face contact. Um, but, you know, he's going to assist in the program as well. and. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna want to come up with a game plan that we think is the best plan to go forward, and then we'll tweak it as we start to learn what works and what doesn't work. And um, you know, we're hoping that that does work. Um, so yeah, that's that is one of our goals, and, and you know, we we understand the need. I have one last question for you in terms of your presentation, and it's just a, a curiosity question for me. That is there a, a use of the vest? Of, is it a, a you know ability to repurpose them for something else after they've expired, or do you just discard them? So we we 
um, they they expire, so that you know ballistically they would not like nobody could wear them. Right. But th there are other uses for them that um, we give them back to the vendor. Oh, essentially. okay. Um, but that but doesn't also, generate income for the to be able to. No, sell, you don't sell them back or anything like that. No, because they're they're at that point they're expired and they're useless to us. Um, but again, we 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 do use them in training situations. Um, and um, we use them to test the, 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 you know, what the impact would be if a firearm was shot at it. So there's a lot of uses that we do get out of it, but um, we essentially don't. You know, we, we actually keep a lot of them too, like except for training, um, but there's no real program to repurpose them. And most of them will just, if the vendor wants to take them back, they take them back, but it's not required. We just don't use them. All right. Thank you, Chief. And thank you for everything that your department does for the town. It's a good, this is our ch chance to tell you thank you personally and to thank your entire staff. We you know, you know the good work that, that's being done. Okay. All right, Mrs. Hurlbut has her hand raised. Um, Chief, um, there's, a, there's a cycle, is there not, on best replacement? You don't just go out and buy a zillion best this year and five years ago and repeat that. Isn't there a cycle uh, so that half the deaths are replaced one year and then all that might be correct? So, yeah, well, so when it, it all depends on when somebody gets hired, too. So, right. so one year we may actually have just one that gets, right. you know, so, so t the 20, um, they're about $500 a piece, you know, so you can add up to this about, there's only about, I think, 10 to 12 people that are getting this year. Uh, so yeah, it's not everybody's getting it but once, and then we're gonna hope for the best at the end. No, we so we hired one person last year. We're hiring one for two people this year. So there's there's you know they would be on a different cycle um, because even they'll be on a different cycle, but they're actually gonna be you know they might be two or three months before the other ones expire. So we have a, you know we have a spreadsheet that you know. So you're continually replacing one. Yeah, this has been Thank you. yeah sure. Mr. Kelleher. Chief, is, is there a DNI initiative within your recruiting program? Diversity and, and integration? Um, in, so our, we don't have a recruiting policy right now, and that's, that's the problem with us. So um, we, um, we don't have one, so we are going to come up with them, but we don't, that's something we need to consider. Um, but at the end of the day, we're hiring the best possible candidate. So. Um, Right now, the only preference that we give is um, to veterans, and uh, if, if that's what you're referring to. So I think you're thinking in terms of your outreach, where you're where you're looking to uh, find people that aren't necessarily self-identifying as want, wanting to be uh, police officers. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of this going around in most in most industries in most companies. Uh, have incorporated DNI into their into their recruitment process. I'm just wondering where we if, if that's going to be part of your initiative when we're doing this work. Well, it's something we we need to consider, and I guess we'd have I'd have to look at um, you know other other departments and how they're recruiting um, because we a lot of what we base on is best practices and what what's the best practice out there to recruit a police officer. It may not be the same as in every other industry. Because it is a lot of skills that, in in you know the, the number one for us is character and, and integrity. Um, so that's that's how we hire, and um, so you know certainly has to be part of the to our discussion into it. So and you know, we're as we start to you know go forward in the policy, the town administrator is involved in the, in the process. So um, you know we will you know we'll speak through him, and, and you know I'm sure there may be. Um, discussion amongst the public. Um, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, our goal is going to be to hire the, the, the best candidate. Sure. Um, in, in, and the best candidate wants to commit to a town of credit, too. Because we're sometimes hiring the best candidate because they don't want to stay. And, you know, that, and that's a difficult thing, too. Um, but we are going through a process right now, and, and all of those things are being considered as, we're, as we are going forward the hiring process. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments? All set?
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Gonzalez. Well, Mrs. Gonzalez has a comment for you. Um, I just having both chiefs in the room. I can't help but mention uh, Trooper Tamar Blue Chief's uh, tragic accident Thursday night, where she lost her life, and it was the end of her watch. Um, although she was a state police officer, anyone who puts the uniform on and takes an oath to protect and serve is a family and I know that you both and your you know everyone felt that deeply so I just wanted to mention that and get the new Thank you. You're hundred percent right. You know, we we're all sick and over it and um, you know the hospital to her and family and state police and law enforcement we all feel. Um, so thank you. Yeah I'd also like to thank you for knowing that that's, that's special. It means a lot to to me, and I know to a part of ours. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel it too. <clears throat> and Mr. O'Leary also, Miss, who has a son who puts that uniform on. Also. All right. Any other comments, questions, Mrs. Helper? Um, I just would like, on behalf of the finance um, committee, to commend you on your amazing report in the book and here. But it's uh, well organized, it gives good information, it's clear, it's almost exciting to read. <laughs> <laughs> and, which is not something I would say about some town reports or uh, years. But I think that, uh, that you've done a great job of presenting your department. In, um, in a reasonable way with good information to um, all in town, but particularly to those of us um, that need to look at it and think about it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Has to be said, Chief. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Mrs. Robert. Thank you. All right. And and on that note, if there's anything if there's anything else you you're all set? Just thank you for your time and support, um, the community support for our department and, and all public safety. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Pull my coffee cup. Oh, it would take a minute to, yeah, refresh. I'm gonna take a, a quick. We'll take a two minute, two minute recess or three minute recess. Yeah, All set. Now we'll call the meeting back to order. In our next presentation, we're joined by Chief Stats of the North Reading Fire Department. Well, welcome, Chief. Thank you, thank you for your nice meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present the North Reading Fire Department's fiscal year 2023 budget request. As we said, I'm the Chief on Stats. In this year's presentation, as you've already heard, we've been asked to cut the presentation short or abbreviated, and that's what I'm doing. And my goal is to focus on my, uh, a brief overview of the past year um, and our, our calls to service, and then on my budget request and goals that have impacted that request, as well as some long-term goals. So, he's going to run the slide for you. Oh, great. Uh, I think you see next slide. Uh, back on you. So as a general budget statement, the North Reading Fire Department spits providing the community with a continued level of excellence from our medical, suppression, and inspection services. Those services depend on funding from the town, which we treat and manage as our own, through efficient budget management, transparency of what we request and spend, and accountability throughout the budgetary process. So, we can't accomplish our mission without support from you and the taxpayers. We take that very seriously, and we, uh, and we try to manage that as efficiently as possible. So a brief overview of the past year. Uh, calendar year 2021 Shaw saw us go back to pre-pandemic levels of the cost of service. So we responded to 2,572 cost of service. 56% of those were 1,400, just over 1,400 those were medical, with 1,064 being transported to local emergency rooms. 
Of those transports, we've collected $831,339 net of the annual billing fees, which is a 78% collection rate. Uh, and that is an ongoing collection effort due to how the collection process works. So they're still collecting on those 2021 uh, bills. So that percentage rate will do nothing but increase at this point. Uh, and in terms of cost recovery, uh, we, according to my calculations, have a positive cost recovery of $480.51 per transport, net of all associated overtime and operational costs, including amortizing the future ambulance throughout this process as well, uh, resulting in a total cost recovery of over $511,000. Uh, my goals that are directly going to impact the fiscal year 23 budget request are, are one, potentially two, one for sure, meaning that I am requesting a new position of day officer, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. I am also uh, preparing for four potential retirements that are unknown at this time, but the intent is there that this is potentially occurring within FY23 which could impact the budget, which I'll get to you further on in the presentation. And one of my long-term goals that doesn't affect the FY23 budget request, but I think we need to keep an eye on and we need to address, um, is increased ship staffing, which I'll get to you at the end of my presentation. The fire department's budget request for FY23 is, in round numbers, $3.9 million which is an increase of $232,000 over FY22. This entire increase occurs within the personal services section of the operations department. The majority of the increase due to an open position from our uh, unanticipated resignation in October of 2021, which I'm currently covering with overtime and trying to hire, as well as my primary goal of hiring a day officer position. $147,000 um, of that increase are due to the new officer position. <clears throat> the 65 or $66,000 in round figures uh, for a new firefighter and associated training costs is another $60,000 and $20,000 differential if we were to create that position and promote somebody into that position. The remaining increase uh, is from this occurred from replacing that resignation uh, for that firefighter position and the training costs occurred there. As well as uh, several uh, contractual obligations that are approximately $19,000, which include uh, my raise, which thank you is money well spent, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the clerical contract increase and the inclusion of the Juneteenth holiday for uh, the union staff. Uh, I'd also like to note that while this is a, a larger increase in the personnel or personal services division, it also decreased um, my purchase services and, and su uh, purchase supplies slightly in those categories. Uh, one important item to note, and I noted in my goals slide, Though not within my FY23 budget request, is that I have been notified about four potential retirements that could occur within FY23. Through consultation with the town administrator, public safety director, and finance director, we're carrying an additional almost $240,000 within the salary pool to cover the new hire and replacement costs, which could increase payroll by $60,000 and an additional $10,000 in expenses per retirement. So that is not within my budget request. It's within the salary pool. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. And it, it could be a possibility. So on to one of my next, my primary goal that is impacting the FY23 budget request, which is the day officer position. Succession planning is important for all positions, but imperative for positions that have the additional responsibility 
of ensuring specific life safety standards are met within the community. Fire prevention is such a position and it is critical to maintain the high life safety standards the community demands through the proper preparation, planning, and training of a successor. My current fire prevention officer is notifying me of his intent to retire in FY23. And I am at a critical point within the department to plan for his replacement and have the necessary person in place, trained, to take over fire prevention and inspection responsibilities, which is why I am requesting this position. What I can't stress enough is this next point, and that is the training for this position doesn't occur on demand. Um, with the Mass Fire Academy, with any position, whether it's a new hire or it's a class or credential, which this is, I have to have a person hired. And that name has to be specific for the class that's applied for it because they don't run these classes all the time and it's very competitive to get into them. Um, if that name were to change, we start the process all over again and that person goes to the back of the line. And that's why I'm stressing this so much. So the training doesn't occur on demand and I need to have a person in place and ready to send to fire prevention officer training when it becomes available at the Mass Fire Academy. In addition to that formal training, I think we could all agree that having on-the-job training with somebody that you can ask direct questions to, especially technical questions such as this case, is crucial. And I don't think you can really put a price tag on that, especially when it de determines life safety standards within the community. So again, the day officer position is a new position filled from either one of the qualified current shift firefighters, uh, excuse me, shift captains, or one of the qualified shift firefighters. And while I focused on fire prevention training for this position, which will be a big component of it, due to the logistics beyond my control, the day officer would have several other responsibilities filling the void within the department. So some of those additional responsibilities are as we've said, fire prevention inspections, incident management, software integration and management, department functioning as a department liaison, uh, permitting within the department and the community, pre-incident planning, and community outreach. <coughs> so each one of those functions now is performed by the deputy chief, who was the fire prevention officer, some of that's performed by me. Um, so while I'm focusing on fire prevention because it's such a technical skill and I have the need to get him trained, this person trained properly, by creating this third administrative officer position, it now allows us, the other two administrative officers, to function a lot more crucially on long-term planning and things can get delegated and accomplished a lot more efficiently and with probably more attention to detail as well. So the budgetary impact. Thanks. The budgetary impact of the day officer position, like I said, is $147,464 in the first year, which includes training and replacement firefighter. After that, the impact or increase of the fire department's budget would be an $86,000 increase. So one-time costs for this position include training at the new firefighter, which I'll get to in the next slide as this position is filled, because ultimately it's going to result in a new firefighter. So I've included that training cost for that person, and um, that cost is one time only it will go away. So that price tag of $147,000 or large will be basically not entirely cut in half, but close to it. So to avoid any confusion, and I hope this doesn't create any, because I'm gonna try to explain it, on how this position would be filled, uh, it would be filled by either a current shift officer or a current shift firefighter based on qualifications. 
I have a case of vacancy within that when it gets created, requiring it to be backfilled. So in the case of a shift officer filling this or basically lateraling over to the day officer position, it creates a void on the shift, meaning one of the shift captains is now filling the day officer position. Now I have a need to fill a shift captain. That would be accomplished by promoting somebody from the firefighter rank up to shift captain. All I did was make the void now at the firefighter rank, which I need to hire somebody new to fill that. If the day officer came from the shift firefighter ranks, there's void there requiring a new hire to fill that position. So in either case, a new hire, a new firefighter would need to be hired to fill that through the, uh, through the promotional process or <coughs> You guys have any questions so far? Yeah, we're still in civil service for fire, right? We are. So you would be taking the requisition from them directly if you had to do it tonight. That's correct. Just the uh, Mr. Right. Hollander. So as far as the, the wage scale of things, are you looking to make this as a, the equivalent of a captain's position or are you looking to get something that potentially could be something like that we don't have, which is like a lieutenant's position somewhere between firefighter and, and captain? Um, my, my intent is to make it a captain. That is my intent. And I say that for a couple different reasons. We don't have shift lieutenants now. Um, when we try to fill a, an overtime shift, let's say, from a shift captain, I think it would create uh, more logistical problems. But that's, that's my recommendation. I certainly want to discuss alternatives, but that would be my recommendation. And then this day officers, it's basically a Monday through Friday position, you know, as opposed to correct two twenty four hour shifts like we have now. And correct. And it, it already exists. It's not a position that you're creating. It already exists. I'm just retiring from it. No, no, no. This, this is, is a new, new position. Oh, all right. The, I think you said the member who's per doing this function. The fire prevention time. officer. So the fire prevention officer is currently. My deputy chief functions as the department's fire prevention officer. He's currently filling that void. Okay. So I'm trying to create a new position that would help us on the daytime schedule, operate more efficiently, plan for the deputy chief's retirement because I need this person okay. training in place before he goes. I see. And if you um, if the assignment ability is within your discretion as a chief? To promote somebody? Or no, to, to shift someone over to this particular assignment. It's, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's a promotion, it's just an assignment to this position. It would be, in some cases it would be a promotion, in some cases it would be a shift. Uh, if it came from the shift officer pool, it would be basically lateral over or taking a day position. Um, but it's going to be based on qualifications. So I have specific skill sets that I need in that position, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez had a question too. So this is basically an admin position, so no overtime. Correct. So if this position gets filled, similar to how the deputy chief operates, he does his position when he takes a day off. It's not pretty overtime. Okay. This would be the same. But would this person be available, first of all? To go on any apparatus during the day, are they going to continue to be trained and be available for response? You know, there's a back shift, backfill, um, whether it be ambulance calls or uh, apparatus going out the door, or is it your intent to not utilize the individual in the position for those purposes? So my intent for this is to keep this person on day shift and not utilize him to backfill at this point. The problem, if I do that, is I'm losing the benefit of having this person on because now he's designated to the shift and all their responsibilities. Or, or augmenting the shift. I, I, I'm looking more as, a, as an augmentation to the shift. If oh, call, yes. you know, Augmentation to a shift, not necessarily... This is a new position, so you're, you're adding an additional pers person on a day <coughs> shift. My question is, are they going to be available to do firefighting responsibilities, or ambulance response responsibilities, and are they also going to be eligible for um, filling in for, you know, captains who are 
on vacation, out sick, you know, on other shifts. So uh, because I mean, it's not apples to apples because they're on a day shift anyway, but would they, they be allowed or authorized to, to work the overnight shift, like, like a 24-hour shift, to backfill? Yes, they would. So that's the, that was one of my points that I was making with keeping the officer rank all the same. Because I think if we don't, it also creates a logistical problem on who gets, who gets to work that shift. And while it's um, something I'm sure we could overcome, I think that keeping the ranks the same, for lack of a better term, makes it, makes it easier. And um, everybody at that point is at the same rank qualification. If it logistically, you know, if they work, you know, eight to five or something like that, and then you have a, a captain who's out, who has a 24 hour shift right now, how would this individual be able to backfill from 5 p.m. to the end of the next work day? So our shifts run, the, the current day, day officer schedule for the WG is uh, 7.30 to 5.30. Our overtime shifts run 7.30 to 5.30, how many days a week? Four days a week, with every fifth Friday. So then our overtime is broken up into days and nights, starting at 7.30 in the morning to 5.30 in the afternoon, and then 5.30 in the afternoon to 7.30 in the morning. So as long as the schedule, which is the same, he would be able, he would be available to fill that void if he was over. All right, I don't want to get into the weeds. But yeah, we'll get into the weeds. Uh, offline. When the deputy retires, will he be replaced with another? Will we hire another captain and move somebody up to deputy? Correct. Okay. So, so this is this hire now is truly an additional position, and we're not going to then move people around when the deputy retires. Correct. This is a position that I need. Uh, well, I stress while well, I am stressing the fire prevention component because of its technical skill set that comes with that and the training that um, I can't just sign somebody up when I have that position in place. They need to be ready to go. Um, and also the ability to work with the current fire prevention officer to be able to go ask technical questions, learn the ropes, so to speak, and be proficient. Plus your be proficient when he retires. So there is no lag in safety or anything to the community. It's basically a seamless process with uh, not a lot of peaks and valleys. Is, is just a couple of follow up questions. Is there a scheduled academy training or is this something we don't know the, when, when the, it's going to happen? We don't know when it's going to happen. So it's based, COVID obviously backlogged a lot of things down at the academy. Uh, but even in pre-COVID times, we didn't know when that training was coming out. So it's generally put out once a year. Like I said, it's very competitive to get into, and it's qualification-based. So if we all apply for it and we're all of rank, and a firefighter applied for it, he'd not get in, based on the amount of seats that are available in that class. So it's, it, it's an open competitive process for a lot of these classes, especially where they don't hold them very often. The final question, do we know, if we have a date for when the deputy is retiring? He said in fiscal 23, do we know if that's the beginning of it, middle of it, end of it, or what? No, and you know, that could change too. So the, the department, if they want certain other incentives, or not incentives, but uh, things to kick in contractually, they're obligated to let me know that of their intent to retire, it doesn't mean that they have to. So that could be, uh, could be in fiscal year 24 for, for argument's sake. Um, he's just telling me that this is possibly his plan for this year. Um, our, you know, in, in thinking about this position, like I've stated before, it is reasonable to think that it's a two year process to get this person up and running efficiently on his own. And that's with working with the deputy, tightly, and then also going to his credentialing training, which is Fire Prevention Officer 1 and Fire Prevention Officer 2, which is pretty lengthy in terms of classroom. So it's, it, if he were to leave in FY24, I actually welcome that, because it gives us more time to prepare. 
So I understand, I understand your need to prepare and be ready for this, but um, are you saying when this class does come up that there's a, there's a chance that your person won't get in there, that it won't even happen? There is a chance. It's a gamble. It's a gamble. Okay. It's definite if, he's, if I don't have anybody in that position. Right. But putting like a captain up for that gives you a better chance to get them into that class. That's how I understood it. It does. If it's, if it's <coughs> going to be that competitive, which I anticipate that it will be, just based on the fact that it hasn't been held for a year. There's going to be a demand. Yeah, there'll be a great demand for it. So worst case scenario, we just have a new hire, and that day officer isn't happening if you don't no. get into the class. Well, what I could do is work while he's waiting to get into that class, have him start working with the deputy chief. Okay. Which is great too. We're just working at it from a different end. Okay. So yeah. So worst case scenario, you're just preparing him and he'll get into the next one. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Miss, oh, Mr. Wilder, I'm sorry. That's okay. Just a quick question. Um, about a year ago or so, you were uh, talking to us about, I think it was a state grant pro program that would let you build up staff for two, three years, it would be paid for. In this case, could we use that to help fund this for the next two, three years, since it would be your intention to keep them after that two, three years? That is a federal FEMA grant that they did apply for. I was going to get to that at the end after the slide, but we, that will not take the place of ship staffing. So what that does is it allows us to increase ship staffing. And it act, it's actually tailor-made for a department like ours where we're trying to transition. Or my, my proposal would be to transition from accommodation department where we use people off-duty and part-time employees to transition the department to a full-time staff. Um, that, uh, addressing this specifically, I don't think we can, but I could look into that. Obviously, that would help under sure. the situation. Yeah. Sure. So I'll jump the gun a little bit, and I'll, I'll probably repeat myself. I have put in for that. It's called Save a Brand. It's done through FEMA. And I've put in for it for $3.1 million over a three-year period. There's generally a cost match to the community of based on population, so for ours, it would be 5%. FEMA has waived that again this year. There is no cost match to the community. It's $3.1 million, and we get awarded to it. Um, my proposal for that was to increase ship staffing. So I'm going to I'll jump ahead because this kind of dovetails into that. Um, and we're kind of talking about it now. So to make a long story short, uh, due to the complexity of calls that the fire department has to investigate and really solve and, and has increased in the resulting often an extended on scene times as well as the amount of overlapping simultaneous calls that occur annually that require the mutual aid from another community and the necessity to call back off-duty personnel on overtime may not be available. Um, I am urging or proposing that as a long-term goal for the community, we hire 12 additional firefighters. Now that is a substantial cost of one point, just under one point one million dollars for twelve additional firefighters. That would give our current shift staffing uh, model an increase of three members per shift for a grand total of eight. I don't bring this up lightly. I think it's a tremendous cost, um, but I also think it's an investment to the community and. It is my feeling that it's it's time now to transition away from, as I said, a combination type department that we are to a full time staff. Um, some of the some of the reasons for this I've already said um, we have an increasing amount of calls that we deal with. 
the complexity, the complexity of those calls and the time on scene it takes us to solve and handle those calls is increasing as well. With our current system, we have an unknown amount of manpower available for callback, just due to the nature of the system, and that's nobody's fault. It's just how the system operates. At times, we have a limited response from our off-duty members for whatever reasons, uh, personal reasons, or, or whatever. And again, it's nobody's fault. It's just that everybody has lives and families. People right now in our department um, have moved out of town due to the expense of living in the community. And that all translates into an increase on manpower being called back in overtime, but also at times of getting a mixed response of personnel that we need. And while I don't want to alarm anybody, that I know he's unsafe with that because we do rely on mutual aid, it's a very inherent, or it's up to the community to provide their first and best effort at providing for them. I can't rely on mutual aid all the time because that will not go over well with the firefighting community. Uh, certain towns have, or cities, financial hardships have done that, and it's not sustainable, um, with us being one of them providing that to the members' communities, um, which we've had discussions with the other people, and had to curtail our response back several years ago. So, some of the ways that we can offset this cost, and that's a large amount, obviously $1.1 million, uh, is to what Mr. Warner has brought up, which I wanted to get to. So I put it for two FEMA grants uh, this past year, one for equipment, and this one that pertains directly to additional staffing. So if we were to be awarded this, in general, for the first three years, this increase would, would basically cover it. And then we'd have to figure out how to how to handle that going forward. And I know that's going to take a lot more conversation than we have time for right now. But it's certainly something that I wanted to bring up and say, forecast basically that this is where I'm proposing to bring us fire department two. Um, another point in in basically self-funding this in a way is is through a decrease in overtime reliance that we currently have. And that is to the tune of almost half a million dollars. If some of those um, were walked back, of course, we need cooperation with the uh, union on that as well, and we bring it there. Uh, but there are realized savings within our current system that would help us offset this cost moving forward. Uh, Mr. Stewart, I'm sorry. Uh, he says, so what would you say the overtime budget? you would project if this was in place versus now? I would say that the overtime, but well, 12 additional people we have to figure in, their vacation time, personal time, and all that stuff. But I can say that if we were to get this, we would see a deep, whatever that decrease is would be close to a half a million dollars. Okay. Are you gonna go to triple decker beds? I mean, what do we have? What do we have for uh, you know, physical plants? Yeah. To well, we're working on that uh, <laughs> too. So, uh, you know, we can. The fire department is pretty resilient. You know, we can make anything work, uh, and we have. This, if this were to happen all at once, which I would not project it to, be just based on how hiring has happened within civil service and how long it takes to be able to get people trained up. We can make anything work in a short amount of time, as long as we know that there's something happening term that could better accommodate us, and I think that right now that's in process as well. Okay, this is Mr. O'Leary, you all good. This is Gonzalez. On that note, um, are we prepared if there were a female to come in? We are, again, in the short term. I've, had, I've spoken with our architect who's helping us with the design plans for the current fire station, as well as um, my peers on how they've dealt with what we now have in fire station. And we have come up with short-term solutions that will work and are completely acceptable. Um, Long-term goal, as, as you all know, uh, should be rectified 
for the future. Mm -hmm. Sis, are you all satisfied, Mr. Sarbanes? Uh, Chief, uh, would you anticipate um, hearing whether or not you would receive the safer grant for 12 additional firefighters? And I, I phrase the question that way because my understanding is they may come back and give you 12, but they also might come back and say, hey, no, maybe six. So when do you anticipate hearing that? Thank you, Ms. Herbert. Yeah, that is a correct statement. FEMA could look at our or my proposal or a request, and they could amend that to from 12 to 8, from 12 to 4. It all depends because, again, that is also an open competitive grant with no community match. You can bet that application certainly went through the roof of the past two years, and um, I'm sure this year is no exception. I intend or I anticipate hearing back early April. So I'm factoring in that I've heard that it may come out as soon as mid-March, but I'd rather, um, I'd rather have happier news sooner than the latest. And a follow-up, if I may, to that, which is, uh, were you to get 12 new firefighters to the grant, uh, do you wonder to include the necessary cost of covering their vacation, et cetera? It does. Because that would not be a part of the same grants. So their salary and benefits are included in the city. And that's something that we did include in that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kellner. Uh, how quickly, if, if it is announced in April, how quickly after FEMA announces that we're uh, successful, do we have to do something to accept it? I believe there's a 90-day window to make a decision. I will get back to you on that and make sure that I'm correct, but I believe it's 90 days. Are we doing a, a more robust analysis? You, you had mentioned that half a million dollars in overtime savings if we get 12 firefighters. Are you modeling this so that when April comes or the 90 days post-April or whenever the award is made comes that we have had a full analysis of how it is that the overtime will come down. Is, is that something you're working on now? Yeah, it's something I've worked on now and, and in the past. Um, that will be contingent upon working with the union and having agreements in place with that. So that will directly affect that cost. The reason I'm asking is, ob is, is obvious is that mm -hmm. without knowing whether this $1.1 million four years from now, when you get the second thing, um, is something we can afford. We need to know whether how much that 1.1 is mitigated, how much it is increased by cost of increases over the next four years, because that 1.1 will, as we've talked about at other settings, will be more than 1.1 million in four years from now. Right. I have a detailed plan that I can present. I'm sure I will at some point, and I have in the past, which shows cost increase 2% per year annually. Right. Um, and I'm sure that, that's probably the easier part. The harder part is the, I, I think, is the analysis of the overtime, because we, we will be relying on that savings to justify the additional expense of having just an additional 12 or 8 or 4 or however many firefighters we have. Correct, and I think that that's important that that, that be done and that be a very robust examination of the interactions of the having the people, their vacation time, all of the overtime, and of course, whatever the actual uh, issues may, may be there and, and making changes to it. Correct, and that's something that I have accounted for. And, and without having that, um, process ironclad in place with the union, I have projected that out to see how that would look and what I wanted to share that with you. And that number of half a million dollars is, is a rough figure that is, is, is real. It's approximate, it's rough, but it is a real number. Okay. And then the final, the final question is the 1.1 million, the, the grant covers compensation and, and benefits. Does it cover equipment and clothing? Turn out here and the like. That does not. 
So I think that needs to be factored into the, into the cost as well because we've got to it's sort of out, outfit, you know, 12 good firefighters. Sure. And I have those costs as well. Thank you. Do you want Yeah. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, just, oh. just to be clear, so say this happens, we hire them. They're officially hired. They're union members. After three years, you don't get to evaluate whether they stay or leave. So there is a... We need, if we were, if that were to happen, we would have to keep them in our arm here for the three years that the funding is there. Right. There's no obligation after that. There isn't. However, my proposal, whether we get the grant funding or not, is to still increase shift staffing for the North Rain Fire Department for the reasons that I've said. But you have the, but you have the ability to say, uh, we're going to let a couple go if you wanted to. We do. You're not obligated to keep them. We're not. Okay. But that would that would that would require other expense associated with laying people off. So, and, and, and in your civil service, so you'd have to look to them to rehire them whenever you're increasing your staff. Anyway, the people that you've laid off. So. Well, the problem with laying people off at that point, um, it would be how it impacts our operation. Of course. And things yeah. and, and concessions that might have been made that impact. You know, pick that impacted those decisions to hire them. So, you know, I'm an advocate all the time for full time permanent staff. This is a, while it's a big amount to propose to the board right now, it's a big expense. Eight shift firefighters is not an unreasonable amount of people for the town of North Reading and our call volume and the services that we provide. No, but I mean, this is an all-in thing for yeah. the future. It's not something you would be, you know, oh, I, when you're gone because we lost the grant. It's an all-in effort, yeah. you know. And this is for however many that you're talking about. Mrs. Hurlbut, back to you, Mrs. Hurlbut. And then I think I Mr. Walters. Mrs. Hurlbut, we can't actually hear what you're asking, so. And I know you can project. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit confused, Chief. Uh, my understanding was about six months ago when you initially presented information concerning the SAFER grant, that we would be required to maintain whatever number of firefighters the grant allowed us or gave us forever. So that, for example, if you got 12 SAFER grant uh, firefighters, and next year you had uh, a current firefighter retire, you could not use one of those 12 to replace him. That's and, correct. And that they needed to stay on indefinitely. No. At, at the end of, okay. No, that's not so correct. correct. So if, if we have somebody retire, we can't supplant them with one of the grant firefighters. That, that's the easiest way to put it. Okay. And then also, we are required to keep them for the period of the, the grant period, for right. three years. That's the easiest way to say it. And then if you say, yeah, not so much, we're going to give everybody a town of firehouse, we'll let them take care of their apartment, you can uh, drop those 12 additional firefighters that came to the same grant at the end of three years? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. But Mr. Walker. Just uh, in, in addition to what Mr. Kelleher pointed out and Steve pointed out, parameters of how to do your analysis, I would like to add on to the management part of this because if you're increasing your staff from 22 up to 20, 34 people, the impact on, you know, you're going to need more supervision. Um, and that would have to be a big part of this analysis. Sure. And part of that would be obviously with span of control issues and division of labor. Um, you know, without getting into the weeds too much, you know, right now I have one ship captain. I would propose having another officer on each shift for that to help and assist with that. Also, with what I'm requesting with FY23, with this administrative officer during the day, would greatly help us in that as well, where you can help not directly supervise them because they'd be at the same rank, let's say, but assist with all the other logistical. Uh, issues that come with that, you know, whether it's gear issues or data analysis issues or, or quality control issues, which we all do now, but we're stretched 
pretty thin to make sure that we're, our product is the best. Yeah. yeah. So when we do that analysis, it sounds like we have a short window of 90 days. Isn't that much? Yes. Having all yes. the parameters there, including facility and what that's going to cost. That's I'll, a, I'll confirm that time. That's a Mr. major Moore. overhead. You know, that's a major amount of overhead we have to consider. And I have, a, I have a follow up on that. Mr. Walner's question, too, is, is let's just say they say, yes, you know, we're going to grant you X amount for 12. Do you lose the grant if you say, okay, we're going to add two, so we're going to utilize the grant up to the cost associated with two? Are you able to do that? Do you have the leeway to do that under the grant? I don't believe so, but I'll confirm that. I believe you have to accept whatever they offer you in full, not partially. Oh, wow. All right. Mr. Mr. Palmer. Uh, Chief, uh, the three per shift proposal, was that based on an operating model you're trying to attain or a grant limitation or life rate? Operating model that I'm trying to attain based on our calls for service with our community, um, our size, and square footage or mile per mile of coverage, and what is reasonable and acceptable. So now, and I don't want to bore you with NFPA standards, but NFPA 1710 has certain performance requirements that no smaller department can really meet. We rely on mutual aid to supplement when we know we actually have an incident. Obviously, thank God fires don't happen every day or issues that require that full 17, or excuse me, 1710 assignment. However, when they do, we can rely on mutual aid to help us as all of our other small towns do. I don't think any small town around or small to an even moderate sized town around us meets that on the initial. Um, so eight members responding and on a shift daily helps us achieve what we need to for uh, satisfying our calls for service to the current calls for service to the community and even projecting that forward. So as we know, we're 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 not getting any smaller. There, there are more and more people coming here. We have higher multi-occupancy buildings going in. Calls for service for us is not decreasing. And medicals, medical, medical calls specifically, but service calls as well, whether it's a false alarm or a, you know, someone stuck in an elevator, whatever that may, might be, they call the fire department for it. So again, going back to our increasing call volume, the complexity of the calls that we deal with requires more technical knowledge as well as more on-scene time spent dealing with that that call. Thanks. You're welcome. So, any other questions? And Mr. Gilberto, I also wanted to see if you could check to make sure the attendees uh, are finance committee <coughs> members attending virtually, because I, I cannot see that. I, I can see them, Madam Chair, and um, I am not seeing any requests to submit questions, nor have any questions okay. been submitted in the chat. Okay. May I add just, just, a, brief, just yes. a brief comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to the Chief, you know, you've put quite a bit of time over the past few years, our, our whole team really has, into looking at this um, issue and the proposed um, staffing you know, model change. But to be clear, your FY 2023 request does not reflect that funding. That you simply put this up as you have in previous years to make the community aware that it's something that we are looking at and, and building towards. So just for anyone checking the numbers, okay, if you look in that budget, you're not going to see this number in there. Yeah, this is a long term, to the, to the town administrator's point, this is a long term look at where I feel the department needs to be. Again, this is not in my FY23 budget. I, I, I will, and I want to prepare you for the fact that I will be looking for additional. Uh, personnel going forward, probably in FY24. Um, I didn't want any of this to come as a surprise. I also wanted to acknowledge the fact that it is costly, but there are ways that we can mitigate some of those costs and make it hopefully more palatable to the board, the FinCom, and the community. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. This is um, Yeah. Um, an observation given what the town administrator has just said and yourself as well that your current budget does not include this and yet should you find out in March or April which is now that you're going to have 12 new firefighters there will be inherent costs that are not covered by the grant such as outfitting which will fall in this upcoming year's budget so how do you anticipate handling that 
Uh, Finance Committee transfer. This isn't the first time that the chief has applied for this. So, you know. so similar, similar to how we have put potential retirements that are coming down or in costs and outfitting of those retirements, um, hopefully that happens. Uh, we will have time to come up with a strategy to do that. And I am looking for the finance giving support for that. Because to put that in my budget now with an unknown just artificially inflates my budget, just like with potential retirement. So I'm not really sure how to handle that. However, what we came up with before these potential retirements was to keep the, the salary figure in salary pool. And Hopefully, if they occur within FY23, I certainly have some money in my operating budget right now on the expense side to outfit retirements. But if not, I'm going to look for assistance from the finance committee in doing this. It's just that how do I ask for potentially $150,000 in equipment costs or put that in my budget without knowing if it's a reality or not? I'm not sure. Thank you. You are. We can supplement the reserve. But <laughs> if, uh, you've done this before, though. You've presented this before to us. Oh, yeah. Have we been approved for this before? We have not. Okay. And then if you did get the, the, if you did get the award and you had the 90 days, you're not going to be filling the positions. With, you still have to go through the requisition process. So that takes Correct. a while and it takes time for the training. So yeah. What's the in a in a perfect world? Yes, award. Everybody's on board. Yes, we can afford it from now and into the future. From award to in the position, how many months do you think that would be? Are we talking the next budget? Potentially, yes. So we have a we have a one year window to put on that amount of staff with a six oh, okay. with an, an additional six month extension that he would keep. So a total, potential total of 18 months to make decisions, or to get these people hired. Okay. So then 90 days was the time that you had to respond, yes, I love these guys, but it could be as much as a year to a year and a half before you actually have to go to the civil service board or whatever. Correct. So Correct. we need to make a decision within that first specified time frame, and then we have a certain amount of time to actually get these people hired if, when working on the park. So that, that is a 12-month window, I believe, with extensions available out for another six, based on the civil service process, as Ms. Minnefell has stated, and much to my chagrin, nothing moves as quickly as I want. So um, it, it is a lengthy process. And so what if you say yes, and then you decide a year from now, no, we're not going to be penalized for that. No, as long as we restore the grant funding in full. So if we say yes and accept the grant and then change our mind, we just need to make sure all that gets sent back to people. Okay. All right. Mrs. Gonzalez. I'm just curious, going back to um, Chief Murphy's uh, problem with hiring, if you get this grant, okay, we're going to go forward. Are you having the same kind of issues as the police as far as people applying? Would you be able to find that amount of people within that amount of time? And if you couldn't, what happens there? Because you're saying, they're saying, this is how many you can hire, this is what you have to hire. I find like with most things, as long as you're transparent about what you're trying to do and the obstacles and roadblocks you may be facing, they're willing to work with you. They just want to know what the facts are. So if we're having, if we be able to hire six through the civil service process and then some kind of way, as long as we're talking to them, and they may ultimately say no, but as long as we're telling them the hardships that we're facing, and they're familiar with that system as well, and they know it, um, there could be even more of an extension given on that grant. And you have a little bit of a different situation with your recruitment. The chief has to actively recruit 
female. He has to actively recruit and go into the network to get female candidates for the role. You can make a special requisition of give me all the qualified, fe eligible female candidates. Give me all of the qualified African American candidates. You can make a special requisition that from which to hire from through the civil service process. So it's a little bit different than the chief's ability to recruit. You you have an ability to specifically request to you know get the diversity diversity of the department. Yes, if that was a performance requirement by the grant, we, we certainly could requisition civil service for that. Uh, you know, right now, in hiring, my one open position has been a little challenging, where we're seeing that a lot of people aren't, in the case of paramedics and EMTs, they're not renewing or going into that field. So it is challenging, and that, you know, unfortunately when I was trying to hire this one position, the list was pretty, pretty sparse already, although we did get a great qualified candidate. Uh, the new list should be coming out. As you know, the civil service list, uh, when it gets towards the end, it is pretty exhausted, and the new list should be coming out March 15th, so this may, this may time, out, time out okay if we get good news. Okay. Any other, Mrs. Gonzalez? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, that was just my concern, you know, the pool of Everybody else? Oh, okay, Mr. Palmer. Uh, yes, Chief. Uh, with regard to the overtime budgeting, I see that 21 was down quite a bit. Did you attribute that to COVID? I did, yeah, I did attribute a lot of that to COVID. Um, if I remember, we also had a couple of new employees who, as the Chief pointed out, with his own staff, you know, that drives down some of those benefit costs. Mm -hmm. That, excuse me, directly relates to overtime. Okay. And uh, the, the, the training has kind of shown a, a, a reduced expenditure to deficit systemically for a few years. Does that infer any kind of training deficit? No, what it, what it refers to is, again, COVID-related things, and I don't want to really blame everything on that, but we are trying to take into account the safety practices, what we comment as well, and then also we asked to reduce some of those training situations. So I haven't decreased my request for that because it's important and I want to see it uh, continue. But I did modify it slightly this year because the hours we weren't using nearly as much as we were anticipating. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, and, and any other questions? Mr. Gilbert going on all set with the... I'm not seeing any here, no. All right, okay. Was that the end of the presentation? Oh, all right. That, yes, that is the end oh. of the presentation. So. <laughs> all right. Well, any other comments for the chief? A lot to think about. You know, a lot, yeah. about. a lot to think about. And again, that's why I, I did want to bring it up. It's not part of my budget request, as it was pointed out. But because it is a lot to think about, I certainly don't want anybody within this room to be blindsided by it. And I'm sure it's going to drive future conversations. So. We appreciate the your you know forecasting yeah. what the department what the town needs really for this department. And also want to thank take the chance and that we have you here to thank you and your membership for all that you've provided to the town, especially during the COVID. It's a different if it's a diff, it's a different time for all of us. So we just want to thank you for the consistency of services that have been provided. And all the extras. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the board, finance committee, and uh, most importantly, the, the members of the fire department. You know? So, yes. you know, we do provide a, a great service, and I'm extremely proud of that. And uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Mrs. Harold. Um, yes, Chief of the Finance Committee would like to thank you for not only your presentation, but also for your clear and timely. Um, inserting the budget book this year. Thank you. It was another great job. Thank you very much. All right. I, I heard it, but Good. I don't think you <laughs> 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 so soft spoken today, Abby. <laughs> oh, you know, it's just one of those things.
call the meeting back to order on our next our next presentation is DPW and we're joined by our staff, Mr. Curry, Mr. Clifton, Mr. Clark, and the rest of the members of your department. So welcome and proceed. Thank you and good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present the FY23 Department of Public Operating Budget. Um, I'll go through the slides um, fairly quickly. Uh, if there are certainly any questions, you can pause and talk about them. Um, so, moving on to our divisions, we have a number of divisions that you're probably all familiar with. Um, so, the Department of Public Works takes care of a number of um, different things throughout the town, engineering, so the administrative issues, roads, and streets, snow and ice, street lighting, tree care, uh, maintenance of machinery, cemeteries, town buildings, stone water, water, sanitation, and fuel. So, we'll touch on these items. Uh, as a budget preview, I've summarized the uh, budgets, the DPW uh, budget, which is basically the general fund budget, of um, totaling 2,919,713, which shows an increase of 142,298, 5.1% over last year's budget. In sanitation, you see a budget of 1,400,887, an increase of 55,324, or 1.1% mainly due to increases in solid waste disposal and solid waste collection contract increases. The fuel budget, you'll see $186,000 budget, an increase of 32728 I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, where gas prices and fuel prices are going. Um, things are kind of um, uncertain at the moment, but it seems like it's going up. So these numbers were presented before you know the most recent uh, issues in Ukraine, but um, you know we can talk about that and see you know if there's more uh, concern that we should um, adjust even further. All right, so uh, and then the, the water budget. So looking at um, a budget of four million six hundred thousand, an increase of one hundred sixteen thousand over last year, predominantly due to. Uh, two and a half percent increase in uh, the rates that we'll see from our uh, purchase of water from the town of Indo. And so I want to highlight, you know, what our, our budget needs are, just so we can, you know, get um, an understanding of what's what's happening in the coming year. So first off, uh, I don't know if you um, are aware, but um, we've been notified by Mark Clark that he uh, his intentions is to retire in November this coming year, uh, this year. So um, we really, you know, need to look at the, you know, the functions that uh, Mark's been doing all these years, and over the years has been quite a lot. Uh, he doesn't just uh, work on, um, you know, the water uh, management, but also he does uh, solid waste and a number of other things as well. I mean, he spends a lot of time, um, you know, working the budget, figuring out uh, fees and uh, implementing um, uh, invoices uh, to be built, uh, built in residence. And so we're going to take a little bit more time. I mean, I put in a, uh, another position uh, in addition to a you know, super water superintendent position, but another position at PE as a business project manager at 75748 And that would be funded, you know, under a, a general fund funding and uh, water enterprise funding. So 25% of the DPW administration, 25% of the stolen water, and 50% under uh, water enterprise. So the uh, the other need that the department has, and it's, it's pretty typical of um, a lot of public works departments, is uh, the need to maintain and care for our trees. Um, they seem to you know, sort of be the thing that you Sort of respond and react to when a problem happens and um, ideally what we'd like to do is really be able to maintain our trees look at the health of the trees and, and take some proactive measures to um, you know cut limbs that may be um, you know dangerous and, and uh, try to save trees or determine that the trees are in fact dead or dying that we remove them before they become a problem later it would be uh, great to have a two-person crew um, that would be <clears throat> have a primary focus of uh, tree maintenance and um, 
we have funded that or we'll put uh, in budget 56,533 for a tree surgeon. That would be sort of like the lead person that would make determinations as to the health of the tree and things that could be done to make sure that the tree either um, stays healthy or if it's determined that it needs to come down, they can make that call. And the tree climber, you know, that's the one that, you know, that that's typically up in the bucket truck or you know, climbing trees to cut limbs or do what's necessary. So it's funded, um, as I said, 56,533, um, 75% under tree care, 25% the stormwater for the tree surgeon and for the tree climber, 52,508 funded 75% of the tree care, and again 25% of the stormwater. These positions would most likely uh, be called upon to do other things other than tree care at times, as you know things come up and there are urgencies and, and um, certain other uh, maybe roadway work or whatever they'll uh, be called upon to assist as necessary. But their primary focus will be maintenance of, uh, of trees in town. And I'll just add that um, last year you wouldn't have seen this on the budget due to COVID-related reasons, but if you remember back two or three years ago, these were positions that were requested uh, back then. So these aren't new ones in this presentation. Um, so we're, we're kind of refreshing those and putting them in again. The business manager slash project manager is a, is a newer creation. Can you give us a sense of what the role of that particular position would be proposed? The business, business manager, manager, project manager. Yes. Yeah, it, it, I believe it would be, as Joe had kind of mentioned, that due to with Mark's retirement, we'd kind of be looking to, to shuffle around duties and potential sewer coming down the road too. We have we have a lot of things going on right now. And, and where some of those items fall out, um, we'd be looking to kind of organize them into a, a potential replacement of, of water side and then all the extras that Mark does plus new new funding requirements due to infrastructure monies that we may be getting as well too. So, so there's, the there's certainly Mark, a need for that's that. That's the Phil Mark's left shoe. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mark's right shoe and this is his left. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mark also takes care of a lot of uh, capital projects under the water, so there's um, quite a bit more that um, sort of would be um, need to be uh, managed in Mark's uh, retirement. So uh, I think, you know, John, obviously the engineering department would be uh, where I would look to put those that management, um, and so you know the functions of the business slash project manager would, would certainly be looking at helping assist with capital projects and um, in procurement of, of different you know, project needs as you know, project needs. This is Robert. Um, yeah, I have a question concerning the uh, tree surgeon. Um, you suggested that if you didn't need him full time, you could do other things like making maybe work on roads. So I would assume that this tree surgeon is not a state registered arborist or anything. So not typically. my question then would be, um, do you really need a certified, for lack of a better term, tree surgeon full time? Could you not perhaps um, find somebody that's skilled as a, as a tree surgeon arborist who could uh, work with your hours. It, I, I think it would be awful difficult to just get some sort of part-time situation going on. We need, you know, a crew dedicated to trees, being able to respond, and also know the trees in town. That, that's the primary focus, as I said. Um, you know, it's it's just at this point pretty typical that you know we don't want any employee just to be um, one focus. Um, you know, employee. I think that uh, they have to be capable of doing other things. And that's why I just sort of said, you know, as far as divisional costs, you know, putting it um, under you know, stormwater, but the primary focus certainly is tree surgeon, uh, I mean, uh, tree maintenance and care. And I think definitely two positions uh, would go a long way. Uh, so yeah. I would add that the question needing two people to handle the trees, I just question the label tree surgeon because that implies a certain level of um, professional education. Well, well, and I and I do think, in fact, that it's important to have somebody that knows both the trees of North Reading. But I equally think it's important that somebody who's really well versed in maintenance and you know what is that disease? And is it really necessary to 
and that's a very different job than what you're doing. Well, no, I, th I think it, one, you know, one minute, I, because we have where, uh, we just need to let the whole question get out and then you would answer, okay? Sure. Just because I can't hear the rest of Abby's question and I'm sure is what, what I suggested to. was that it was important that you have somebody that really understands diseases and other issues with trees, not just somebody that was good at deciding which leg to cut off. Yes. Okay, Mr. Gracie. Right, so, um, you know, I actually did a little um, online um, viewing of true definitions of tree surgeons and arbors and things like that, just to, to make sure I understood the differences myself. But certainly a tree surgeon is somebody that we expect to know uh, a bit about, um, you know, diseases and, and if, you know, a particular tree or um, disease is uh, being, uh, infecting the tree, but it isn't an arborist. It isn't, you know, there's certainly higher certifications in, in education uh, that an arborist would, would have. We're not looking for that. We're looking for you know somebody actually that is you know in the field doing the work, but still has a certain knowledge to uh, make those types of decisions. There are like four week courses that I would expect that this person would, would take it, not already having that experience, and uh, being able to make your decisions in the field. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Crazy. Who is the person that's currently? doing that function. Well, right now we, we utilize, you know, whatever available uh, uh, personnel we have in the highway department most likely, and maybe parks as well, but, um, you know, so we'll respond to issues as they, you know, come up. Uh, if there's some, a limb down or a tree fell down, we'll, we'll send whatever personnel we have to cut it up, get it out of the roadway. We're talking about, you know, in advance of these things happening, going out and understanding what has happened with, with the trees if they are um, dying from a certain disease or if there are limbs that have died, but if you cut this limb off or another, that you would you know, save the tree um, and have a more healthy tree and uh, eliminate a, a potential um, situation where a limb falls on a, in the roadway during a storm. Mr. Clifford, Mr. Mr. I wanted to add to that. Yeah, too. I just want to add a little bit to it. Um, partly the way it's set up is we have, you know, Typically, we have we hire arborists, so we hire them contractually um, outside of everything else that we do, and we also hire um, contractors to remove trees. And the contractors that we hire to remove trees are anything that our current crews don't have capacity or skill level for. Um, and typically, the way that trees are maintained is through highway slash water because we kind of all do similar functions. So you're taking people away from potholes to cut limbs down on trees with a chipper truck. So what we're really looking to do is not take away from the arborist piece of it, but looking to kind of lower our costs of contracted tree removal companies. We're still gonna need, you know, uh, contractors for large tree removals that involve cranes, but it's that middle ground of tree removal because we do, have a lot of trees in town, we have a lot of wetland areas in town, and it's a very regular problem around our streets. So we're looking to kind of reduce some of the, um, the contracted services and replace them with that, this middle level. Who they, you know, they're gonna be a tree surgeon, but we're also gonna be looking for them to kind of help out in the day-to-day -day other things as, as they pop up as well, which is why they're funded out of multiple sources. Mr. Kelliger? That is my question. My question was whether we would need to contract with an hours for assistance, and you would answer that question. Thank you. So Mr. O'Leary? Leah had her hand up. Oh, Mrs. Gonzalez. I was just curious if you had a ballpark of those contractual. Yeah, it fluctuates greatly year to year. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what we spent last year on it, but um, it depends on how it comes up. But. It can, it can get big. I mean, right now, we've actually, through large capital, we put in a $75,000 tree removal slash sidewalk repair um, right. item that we received last year and we're working right. on again this year. Um, so that's 75,000 right there for, and that includes some paving. Um, in addition to that, I believe there's at least another 75,000 that we have for on-call slash emergency, and that's reactive okay. type things. We're looking to try to add some proactive measures as well. I'm just trying to look at yeah. what you're looking for for a salary compared to right. what we would be saving yeah, we can on that. Certainly run that analysis. Yeah. 
Mr. O'Leary? Yeah, that's what I was just uh, thinking. If we were to use co contracted services, you know, to do preventive maintenance and things of that nature, um, you, you certainly are talking about 110,000 plus another 15,000 per employee plus for uh, for benefits. You know, that's 120, 130, 30 thousand dollars we're looking to spend it on employees here. You know, with that 130 thousand dollars for contracted services, where we don't have employee benefits and retirements down the road. Mm -hmm. We need the services, and, and I, I agree. We need to be more proactive uh, in, in addressing the, the tree situation and the care of the trees. You know, should we be modeling more towards the contracted services to get a better idea as to what the expectation would be? You know, if it's, a hundred, if it's an equal thing here, right. the, the, the tail end of things are uh, you know you don't have retirements, you don't have insurance costs, you don't have all these other fluctuating things, and you don't have step increases and everything goes along with it. But, I don't think it's equal, though, because I think when you've asked for this before, you're still going to, you're still factoring in the budget, the tree removal services. That's not coming out. So you still, you still need that as part of it. Right. Yeah, what I'm saying is if we have a need to address it, then you need to expand that portion of the budget to cover the, the preventive maintenance and additional analysis to be done that these two positions would be doing. That's all. It just Should it be an employee or should it be... Continue expansion and expansion of contracted services. Okay. I see. Okay. There's no doubt that we need it. Um, Mr. O'Leary, are you all set? Somebody had a hand raised. Yeah, Summer? I just had one great question. Um, I I also believe that you have a item on the capital budget that we're, that calls for the purchase of a bucket truck. Um, and and your suggestion. Uh, was that that would go a long ways towards aiding the, form of, the forming of, or newly forming of a, a tree department. Would you, what would you use, would the, what percentage of time do you think of the bucket trucks could be used for tree work and is it going to be used for anything else or is it strictly trees? Uh, well, the bucket truck is, uh, first of all, the, the existing bucket truck is, um, you know, uh, an older uh, model truck and uh, living its usefulness. I think it, you, know, you have to be concerned about you know, safety of, of the use of those trucks. So that's why, you know, predominantly we uh, have asked for the bucket truck. We have one, but it needs to be replaced. Uh, the bucket truck, you know, is used for uh, tree care or, or you know, tree removal, but also we use it for decorations, I believe. And Christmas lights. Christmas lights and a number of other you know, things that we need to reach. If we need to do some work on um, you know, roofs or something like that, that could be done as well. So, so it has some other uses on those trees, but. No, I understand that you have an old bucket truck that, yep. that is uh, not in great shape and that if you need a bucket truck, you should certainly replace that one. I was just wondering how much, what, if, if this bucket truck request is primarily for the, uh, newly formed tree group, in which case that needs to be considered, the cost of that needs to be considered in addition to the uh, tree surgeon and tree climber. So I'd say, you know, well certainly I'll, I'll put it this way, if, you know, the tree surgeon and tree climber positions, you know, additional uh, positions were not added to the budget, that wouldn't mean that we wouldn't need the, the, the request for the we back to, um, yeah, we still need it. Well, said, Mr. I am, thank you. Okay. Who was our tree warden? You, Mr. Crazy? Um, yeah, so John was playing that role before I got here, but I think we've sort of um, switched, switched that a little bit. Um, John certainly uh, goes out and does a lot of uh, investigation still and makes determination. Um, but I will uh, preside over the hearings and hear information that John brings to the table and residents as well and make, make decisions based on that. Another title for your calling card. There you go. Yeah, I can't fit it all on now. <laughs> can, can you get any, um, years ago we had a forest committee, which I understand has recently been resurrected. Is, are they at all, um, is, is, is it at all possible to have any of those people Consult with you, help you out at all. I don't mean plant trees, but 
point out or, or help in, in determining I, I don't know stuff. Do. Perhaps. You're unaware of this? I mean, I, I think I've had um, maybe one conversation or so with somebody that. Um, yeah, I don't know how big or active it was. It used to be fairly active, primarily because of the town fires. Um, and I don't really, but I did see that it had resurrected itself. And, and so that could be a good source if it really got off the ground and if you could, if you found it useful. So we uh, look like we've gone to the next uh, screen. So I want to also sort of summarize our uh, needs in the uh, miscellaneous small capital. And so the request that we we have in the operating budget is um, talk <coughs> talk request the uh, cemetery parks and grounds uh, long lawnmower trailer. So the trailer we have now is constantly breaking down, requiring repairs, unreliable. Um, so we want to make sure we have a you know. A, Safe transportation of our um, mowers to uh, to the to the sites where we're doing maintenance. So that's a request of nine thousand dollars for that piece of equipment. Shooting and maintenance. So uh, we have in all of our vehicles two-way radios, and so we need some upgrades of our radios in uh, most all of the trucks. You know, some of the trucks are a little bit newer and may not need upgrades, but most of them do. So we have a twenty thousand um, dollar request for upgrades of those radios. Um, also in the uh, machinery maintenance, we're looking to um, purchase a plasma cutter. So plasma cutter is sort of like a um, cutting torch, but it does uh, a much needed job uh, of cutting metals. And so when we're doing body repairs for our equipment, um, you know, having a plasma cutter is certainly going to be more efficient and um, produce a, a, better, a better repair, better job. So looking at having that purchase as well. We have a newly hired uh, mechanic that has uh, experience with plasma cutters, so we certainly want to give him the right tools for him to continue doing a good job for the town. Under town buildings, uh, we want to replace the DPW rear yard entrance gate. So, you know, currently, um, you know, there's some ball heads there, and I, I think just having better control as, as to who goes in and out of the year, uh, rear uh, yard. Um, is good, and uh, we would like to have a gate that is easily activated. Uh, I think they have, um, you could use the two-way radios to open and close the, um, the gate, the electronic gate. So we've looked for um, a company that can provide us um, a, a gate that can do that. We've got a quote for 21700 We have some additional work we do in-house to uh, you know, create a concrete pad and things like that. But uh, I think if we had more funding in 2007, we could um, uh, have the gate installed and have better controls on uh, access to the backyard. And that would, <clears throat> that would I, th I think the system we have with the radios would allow uh, running light to easily come and go as well without having to get out of the truck and you know, push a button and get back in. But I think having some controls there is, is a good thing. So in the water um, department, we have, um, yeah, we do a lot of excavations, making uh, water uh, repairs. Um, a trench box is a safety item that I think is necessary for um, any DPW water department toolkit. So we're looking for $5,000 uh, funding request for purchase of a trench box. Total of all these requests, $57,200. Any questions? You do, have, you do have trench boxes Right now, right? You just want to add another one? Well, what is your, what is your so, yeah, we do have, we have a trench box that's getting old and starting to fail, so we're looking to replace it. All right, so I wanted to uh, jump in uh, quickly, uh, uh, highlighting you know, other budgets. So, the sanitation budget, I know there was a lot of discussion on uh, sanitation uh, maybe a week ago, but um, highlighting sanitation, we have. Um, an FY23 budget of 1,400,887. We have an increase uh, over last year's budget, but that's probably due to, um, as I said, solid waste and rec recycling cost increases for disposal and collections. Uh, via uh, fuel vehicle pool. So we have obviously uh, some uncertainty going on there, but I did take a look at you know what we've been currently experiencing for um, 
pricing on other voices, but also looking ahead um, what is being projected from the U.S. Energy Information Administration um, projections. And so even that does not you know, take into account what's happening today. And, and so there is some concern. Um, I did want to um, make sure that I, as best I could, you know, have uh, fuel costs covered. I did some analysis um, on each of the apartment uh, uses and made sure that we know what the quantities of purchases would be uh, if they hold true to what they have been in the past. Uh, and, and some projections on where the price per gallon would be for both gas and diesel. I ended up deciding um, to adjust 10% uh, upward um, on the most recent invoice. As I looked at you know, the last 12 months of fuel purchases, you could see the increase significantly jumping you know, from month to month. And, um, you know, still, you know, currently, you know, seeing the situation now is 10% and up. You know, it, it's it's a difficult, uh, you know, thing to analyze, I guess. And so there's still some concern there based on current events. So looking at uh, administration, uh, 181856 primarily for contractual uh, increases in personal costs and the business uh, project manager um, funding. Engineering division, so the uh, 77,013, increase in personal services support, getting reflect personnel contracts, and also some professional services increases, and John uh, may be able to speak a little bit more on that, but there's, you know, it's not a big number, but it's you know, certainly a 194% increase that um, which reflects past um, year use. Yeah, so just briefly, in the past two years we've had, you know, a couple of culverts fail on us and um, some bridge, emergency bridge maintenance as well. So this is kind of to cover some of the, the additional engineering that, that we've put through the budget and kind of stretch ourselves thinner due to it, um, but still made it through. So this is looking to kind of increase that to reflect what actual costs have been. Road streets. So we have an FY23 budget request of 606,491. We're um, just, there's a few things changing, you know, decrease in personal services, increase in purchase of supplies, increase in purchase of services. So things um, have been raised in certain line items and lowered in others. Uh, not a great uh, significant increase over last year's budget, but um, you know, we made some adjustments in the line items that you know, reflected our true cost on today. So, so just, nice, just, just to relate to the, I mean, you know, obviously this, this time of year, obviously the, the roads are <laughs> in everybody's minds. I mean, doing a lot of pothole filling, and, and it appears as though a lot of the roads are deteriorating even more. In relation to, I think we have what a five-year plan scheduled to do different roads and stuff like that. Um, does it appear to be realistic that that five-year plan is going to work out to do it? Or we never have enough money to, to do what needs to be done. But are we, going to, are we falling behind because of the deterioration of some of the road conditions? To me, it just seems that a lot of them around town are, are in worse condition than, than they've been in years. Right. And, uh, and I know we stepped up efforts you know, a few years back to get a more realistic approach on the Thing. I just don't know how we're we doing in relation to our plan. So I'll, I'll let John comment in a minute about how we feel so we're doing. I, I know it's always a challenge to um, you know stick with a plan or get funding for a plan that you think would be um, uh, the, the best way to approach you know, roadway um, maintenance. And so when that happens, You'll see, you, you see the effects, especially at this time of year, where the roads will start failing, or potholes will um, happen everywhere. And it's 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 difficult for the crews to stay on top of that. It happens at night. It happens at every rainstorm. Um, and the best thing to do is try to identify those roads that are that need significant repairs and replace it on a timely schedule. Well. You know the problem again is funding. So, John, what do you what are your comments or thoughts? So, on yeah, that? I mean, we've. Uh, I think we're not. I wouldn't say we're falling behind. I think we've had a really tough spring and, and winter, and pre thaw cycles have been a roller coaster ride. So right now, you know, driving around the streets, it looks rough. But we have multiple streets right now that are going to be 
paved early in the spring um, up around street mount vernon street um, and then north street um, trench repairs uh, after the water main um, the five-year plan that i had developed um, that we've been on track we just lost one year due to covid and we've, we've stayed on track with that and, and that was ideally focused on neighborhood paving uh, we did the peter and anthony neighborhood we did um, the westwood circle neighborhood right now and, and completely redid the, the sidewalk streets curves and everything and those have worked out really well we're, we're trying to stay on that plan i have a request from the, the gordon uh, linwood neighborhood for next year to, to repay all of those as well um, the other thing that's always in the back of my mind too is we're, we're working steadily on on the sewer project and I don't want to go too into roads like Lowell Street, North Street, Concord Road, and you know I don't want to jump ahead of the sewer too fast by paving those when we could potentially be putting some underground. So I know that Lowell Road is in, I mean North Street is in rough shape, and Lowell Road and, and Concord, but I'm going to let what the next year dictates and, and, and take it from there. So yeah, we're staying right on track with the five-year plan that was focused on here. And we've also had a lot of underground work that we've done ahead of the river work. Uh, Upper Elm required a full drainage reconstruction, nearly 700,000. North Street required water main. Uh, Mount Vernon required water main. We're looking to do the Shady Hill neighborhood water main in the next year as well. Follow up with paving after that. And those are those are as far as our road rating program is. Those are the worst roads right now. And we have a plan to attack those worst roads in the next two years, two, three years. Any questions? Mr. Palmer. How often are the road condition assessments done? Typically do them every five years. We're right around the five year mark now. I'd be looking to, I don't have it in this year's capital, um, but I'd be looking in the next year to refresh that. And there's a lot of new technologies that are up now to assess the road situations. It's not as objective um, as it was in the past. So, so. We're looking to do that in the next year. I'll probably have that in next year's capital request. I have a full full plate for this year's paving uh, program, so I'd be looking to add that into the next year's capital request. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so uh, snow and ice. And I think most are familiar with um, macro law that allows for a level-funded uh, snow and ice budget. And, um, you know, seeing what happens uh, in any given year as far as the cost of snow and ice removal. Uh, we've been, I believe, at $175,000 for a number of years, and we continue to level fund that budget. Uh, currently, we have expenditures in this uh, winter season of $502,250. Any other questions? Mr. Palmer? All right. Well, but historically, we know it costs us. Well, why would we not? Why aren't we making some correction to that line, that Mr. Gilberto? Through you, Madam Chair, as you know, the state, state law requires that you continually fund your appropriation for snow and ice at at least the prior year's level in order to be able to um, deficit spend in a given year. So we have not made this adjustment in probably at least 10 years, I'm guessing, for the 175000 what you're not seeing here is what Liz has carried in the revenue and expense plan and does carry each year for the deficit spending that occurs nearly every season. Um, is it 3 350 <coughs> in this current fiscal year for carryover? So you're not seeing what we are projecting to carry as an expense into next year as allowed by state law, but that's a $350,000 um, allowance on top of the $175,000. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, you know, we're clearly still there <laughs> in terms of the challenges as we often are but um and we've been we've made a, with the board's you know input we've increased that i think from 250 eight years ago uh, you know over the years we continually have been you know incrementally increasing that okay. that's a great point madam chair thank you and for the board's edification yes i've authorized deficit spending for snow and ice <laughs> <laughs> removal there was a change in municipal finance law that no longer required an affirmative vote of the select board um, but it does happen um, and uh, we will get the board a report at an upcoming meeting um, showing the, the many nights and mornings that the department has unfortunately been called out because of the nature of the weather this year. 
It's always, always interesting to see what Mother Nature has in store for us yeah. and when. Mm -hmm. And again, you were able to retain enough contractors, so kudos, yeah, to, we were, we were kudos to you and Chris and being able to work that out. Because mm -hmm. not all, all the communities were in the same position we've been in, so it's very fortunate. Mm -hmm. So glad the effort was put in and it was successful. So uh, touching on street lights, uh, the FY23 budget request is 78782 a 3% increase. Uh, we reached out to uh, Red Light to see what their thoughts were, and um, so we're recommending a 3% increase on um, current budget. Tree care, so we touched on on uh, that. We Excuse me, just, just to just Red Municipal Light, I mean, what about their fuel costs now? Well, it's probably still... Could we get wet? No, that's true too. I mean, there is there's a cost of you know sort of generating electricity or, or yeah. So that three percent was prior to all the the goings on, recent wow. goings on too. So we might want to just touch base yeah, on we'll, again. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to do a little bit more uh, investigation as to what the whole energy situation is like. Um, we'll, we'll try to do what we can to get more information from our suppliers. So the uh, the creek here, I think we, we touched up uh, on that. We have a total budget of 127, 181, uh, with the uh, major expenses being in um, the uh, two new positions, and um, everything else pretty much uh, level funded. Machinery maintenance. So we have a budget of 336, 943, um, a little bit over last year's budget of 305071. Uh, miscellaneous, miscellaneous small capital being you know, 21500 for those uh, the radio upgrades and the platform cut and some during grounds. Budget 188, 426. And we have a uh, miscellaneous small capital of 9000 one more with a one more trailer. And the else is reflective of uh, personnel cost increases and some person, um, personal services increase. So town building budget. We are looking to, it's pretty pretty much a level funded budget, but there are certain line items that we felt needed just to be um, adjusted upward, and um, there were certainly supply concerns or cost increases, so we made um, some minor adjustments there. We have a miscellaneous small capital of 217 for the um, UPW rear yard entrance gate that we increased the FY23 budget, uh, uh, 454000 and uh, predominantly is the increase in personal services to reflect contractual increases, um, some portion of the new position for business project manager, and the tree surgeon, tree climber positions. Water Enterprise. So we have uh, FY23 budget um, that, you know, again, predominantly was increased to reflect, um, while there's some contractual increases of the current uh, contract, but also um, having some expenses uh, from the water that we uh, purchased from Andover being uh, two and a half percent. There's some other um, other costs, indirect costs, and debt service that have gone up. Debt service gone down. Um, so we're netting a uh, budget change of one hundred sixteen thousand seven dollars, two point six over last year's budget. Uh, we have a note retained earnings currently approximately two million eight hundred thousand dollars. That. Uh, so we have some summary numbers. I don't necessarily think we need to go over those in any detail. If anybody has any questions, I'll just let, let you look a little bit. Thank you. All right, questions. Let's go to some questions. Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Roy. Ms. Roy. Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to make note that um, the DPW uh, union contract is expiring or has expired um, and we are in the process of negotiations presently so this budget does not reflect any contractual changes for contract settlement when mr parisi notes contractual um, changes that would be any step upgrades that the current employees are are receiving uh, the same goes for fire and for police all of those contracts um, will be up or are up. So just keep that in mind. Um, and we carry those figures in the salary pool. So, but 
but I just want to make sure everybody is aware that these three budgets do not include um, any contract settlements. Questions? Questions from those attending? I'm just going to stop sharing for one moment, Madam Chair. Well, while Mr. G I have a question for you, and this is just more, you know, planning in advance. I haven't read anything on this topic, but similar to the um, fleet vehicles for police that have shifted to electric, do, is there such a thing, uh, you know, is there the potential for that for the vehicles that are necessary for you to pr provide services? So these, you know, the equipment that you need, and is there anything like that? It's well, it, it's a little bit uh, more of a challenge if you're talking about larger vehicles, you know, dump trucks and things like that. Um, I know that they're starting to reduce those. Uh, I don't know, you know, how well um, that would uh, work in that situation. Uh, but certainly the administrative type of vehicles uh, could be electric, you know. Um, but it's difficult to start, start converting some of the larger pieces of equipment that we have to work on. Um, any other questions, comments? Mr. Walmart. Uh, just two questions. One is, I think uh, Ms. Gonzalez was talking about the tree budget, you know, the outside contractors. So when I go back to that slide, you're showing the 2022 budget of 45000 Was that all outside contractors? Is that what that was? Yes, it would be. And in, in we typically go higher than that, depending on emergency calls. Um, so exactly what we spent last year but that's what we budget as it's almost like a snow and ice type of not you know not to that extent but you know we budget for forty five thousand a lot of times we have to towards the end of the season we have to pull out from the spots for that. I, I, I for some reason I expect that number to be a lot higher based on what I thought I heard. So it does kind of suggest that you know having someone who is aware of trees that need attention or you know there's like proactive things they could be doing it does kind of point to me to say that when it actually comes to cutting the trees, to just like do that, do that, do that, right? We're prescribing for someone to do that. And maybe you can tell me why that doesn't work, but um, it seems like hiring one person dedicated to trees makes sense to prescribe and analyze, but actually doing the work, it seems like it's still an outside contractor type activity. Does that, does that not work? Well, we'd be removing some of that activity from our current uh, you know, workforce as well. So the highway, this wouldn't have to be out there trimming the trees and be able to focus more on pothole repairs. You know, we kind of work as you know, if you call the tree surgeon, that would be a main focus, but they'd be helping in, in other things as well. Just like we have water department that helps with paving roads as well. So it'd be coming from a bunch of different groups. All right, and then on the water department, thank you, and then on the water department. You know, as we are, I don't know when we're connect. when are we turning on the Andover? When are we turning on our pipe? Is it July of this year? It's on. It's on. No, we, it's on. Oh, it we're fully. We're 100%. We're 100%. 100%. We have been. So were we going to see, I thought we were going to see a, depress, a decrease in uh, water department personnel. So we actually did. There were uh, two positions last year that were the personnel costs went to the expense cost in the FY. 22 budget. So we went from uh, the staff we had, there were two positions that now are no longer in the personnel cost budget, and that money was used due to the increase in the cost to purchase additional water from Andover. So that savings has already happened, there's no more to be experienced. Correct. So we, if you look at the difference between the FY21 and the FY22 water budget, that's when we did all the, we're not buying the chemicals that we used to buy, we not using as much electricity as we're not pumping the water. So a lot of expense lines were shifted and a lot, you'll see the, the Andover cost went way up that year. The personnel cost went down, the electric cost went down, the chemical cost went down. So okay. it's kind of uh, factored into the FY21, I believe it was the FY22 budget. Okay, thank you. Do you, uh, how much did the, um did the outside professional services cost this year for that? So we had a few really significant with wind storm events. Was it more than what you had budgeted? Did you have to go above that? 
Are we talking about fees? Yes, oh. removal, okay. removal services, yeah. As far as contract? Yes, because you don't have the equipment to do it yourselves, right? Certain things, right. There's, there's, a, there's a kind of a middle ground. Uh, we, had, we did have a lot of crane removal, um, trees and some emergency wind blown trees. Uh, and some of it we handled in house. Uh, so we have to look at exactly where, what happened and where it came from. Do you have a sense of whether you were on on budget with what was for professional services, or did you go over budget this year? For professional services, yes. like um, yeah. like arborist type services? No, or for like no tree removal. Contracted services. Yes, contracted services. Yeah. Yes. Um, I believe we were higher than what we had, but I can remember that it, it's one of those line items that um, you know can take care of some other things as well. But if um, there's a lot of issues with the tree, it leads up a bunch of line items. A tree surgeon, you're talking about? That. I'm, no, I'm talking about having to hire a contractor to deal with um, tree complaints that have come to our attention, and we need to act on that before you know it becomes um, a problem. If it falls and we did nothing about it, that puts the town in a certain liability. Um, so you know we do want to respond to that, but again, it's you know we're we're sort of not uh, being proactive as as we could be with uh, in-house crews looking at issues and trying to deal with them in-house uh, with a bucket truck. But there could be, I think John was explaining, trees that are so large or in positions that we can't access with a bucket truck that you need to call a company that has a crane that will be able to crane in, hook on, cut, and, and pull out to the street those large trees or pieces of trees. So that's never going to come out of the budget though. That, that will never come out of the budget. It's going to need it always. Right. So just with the addition of those two poles though, that's right. not necessarily eliminating that cost. You know, but, but there are some things that we could probably um, you know help reduce contractual services um, with a crew like this that um, where you know we have a lot of sidewalk trees. And I think John was, was trying to deal with uh, repairing sidewalks but first gonna deal with the trees. Um, but we had a crew that had the ability to stay focused on that, stay ahead of, you know, the areas that John wants to repair the sidewalks. Those trees typically aren't, you know, that large and typically, um, you know, in, in an area close to the roadway that we can access and we can deal with. Um, you know, certainly there's some other things after the fact, and you know, we're going to go down and kind of grind down the stumps and, you know, we don't necessarily have that type of equipment, but maybe we can do a little back out. But, but there's a lot to it, you know, above the ground and below the ground. Yeah, there's not, I know that we're looking for one line item to say we're eliminating this and putting this, but it's very, you know, it's a much bigger it's issue than that, you know. Um, it comes from a lot of different pools and different personnel that, that do similar type things. So it could get, you know, better, you know, quicker pothole repair because we have somebody that can deal with trees, you know, that type of, and it can be a ripple effect. Okay, any other? Can assess one other? Question: Like on the water, I live on Lakeside, so there's you know the Lakeside water pump or whatever it is is down there. I see someone there every day. What's the? I mean, that's going to be closed, I assume, at some point. What's the ultimate outcome of that building or other ones like that in town? So we still go there every day, and that's where we kind of do our laboratory testing. So we're buying water from Andover. We're adding chlorine to it currently. We're finishing, hopefully, within the next two months, the two permanent chlorine facilities where the water comes in. So we sample the water, the guys go there every morning and there's a laboratory with you know a little analysis they do there every day. Um, ultimately what's gonna happen to that facility, we also have the West Village water treatment plant. It's kind of up in the air. Um, that building, Lakeside, it doesn't the, the land itself doesn't have a lot of alternate use to it because it's kind of, it's an island yeah. right across from the pond with wetlands all behind it and on you know basically the other three sides are all wetlands. So. The building itself is high and dry, but the rest of the property is kind of surrounded by wetlands. Um, we don't really have a defined use for that building. It's not something that really lends itself to being retrofitted either. It's got two big filters out back. Um, West Village probably has a little better life. It's a, a newer building. It's a 1996 building. Uh, has some current office space there. There's been a little talk about, you know, could we possibly take some of the load off Town Hall by shifting water offices or engineering down to that building. That hasn't gone anywhere, so I'm not like laying that on the table as yeah. a, a potential. But there are potential uses for those buildings. Um, they would 
Again, the other one is a treatment plant too, so it has a lot of filters and equipment, mechanical equipment inside it that would have to be removed to make the whole building useful. But uh, we currently use, like down in West Village, there's a garage bay, so we take our uh, emergency vehicle for water and we park it down there in the winter time, so that's out of the elements. Um, but certainly there's some uh, repurposing that could be done at those facilities. Okay, thank you. Any other, um, this is Farrell the um, the the water uh, building that was built in the 1990s is in fact part of the infrastructure of uh, the uh, facilities master plan committee's looking list, and is something that will certainly be considered to be repurposed. At the moment, there's too much water department equipment inside of it to, to do anything. But going forward. Um, it could be used for any number of things, including town archives, because it's a fairly safe, dry building. So the problem with that facility is the access, if anyone's ever been down there, is you have to go into Wilmington, go through Shea Concrete Yard, and then it's down about three quarters of a mile down a dirt road. That this time of year is not the best to travel, and uh, when we get floods, it goes underwater by a couple of feet. So it's not that the easiest access. There is no actual street address to that. There's no street access or valid street address for that building. But, uh, you, you're right, it's a good facility and it could be, it definitely has some future use to it. You add another road, bridge, and ATV <laughs> to your list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could put in for a helicopter. Next Hel yeah. <laughs> so Mr. I was saying now Mr. Clark's historical and institutional perspective and his work ethic are irreplaceable so we need to really get someone that can kind of see a little bit of that just a little bit of that while we still have him to, to I don't know how we're going to replace him so and you have a great staff I know we talk about trees I know in the capital um, the capital planning Mr. Clifford, you're, you're very proactive in alerting to, to those type of issues that you see on the road as you're surveilling areas for work. So, you know, I can understand this because it's not the first time you've presented these requests for these positions, and I can understand why they're here. And, you know, let's see what we can do about that. It's always an issue of money. So, Mark, last budget hearing. You give us a thumbs up. I'll probably attend the future. <laughs> you just kind of wing yourself off. <laughs> That'll be good. But, uh, any other questions? Are we good? Any other questions? Comments? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Palmer. Um, there's a little change in machinery maintenance, about 40K from services to supplies. Is that reclassification or is that some change in practice uh, looking at expenses uh, yeah just I was looking at the machinery maintenance detail and you know there's 38,000 out of services and into oh, the supplies mm -hmm. yeah so it's not up here it's in the right. it's in these things I just, yeah I, I think we were uh, just shifting some line items basically from um, you know, certain line items that we weren't spending from to others that we needed to really make those purchases from. I don't okay. think there's a significant overall increase, but just where we charge those purchases. Okay, but I mean, services is sounds to me like people and supplies sounds like hardware. Oh, I so um, I just didn't, didn't know if there was some kind of notable change in practice. I think we just looked at kind of historically what had happened, and Joe's right. It's chewing things up. Looking back, yeah, the supplies line might have been overexpended and the services under or vice versa. So we just try to more align it with what mm -hmm. truly has been spent. Okay. And we do have a new mechanic that has come on in the past year as well who is much more capable. Okay. So that, you know it's that type of and we don't have to hire as he much. He wants to fix them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. He's right. right. He's right. 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 You know, so. <laughs> so that it goes in line with the plasma kind of request. You know, we yeah. want okay. our mechanics in house to do more work. No, I can chop it out. Okay. Um, yeah, other than being extraordinarily depressed that uh, Mark has decided to pursue a singing career rather than <laughs> continue here, um, 
I also wanted to recognize Joe Parisi as being new man on board from the standpoint of Saturday morning department chair, uh, fun parties, and uh, to thank you for your good efforts <coughs> and to say that it's been enjoyable working with you briefly for your tenure thus far. Well, thank you. Um, I hope to be around a while and we'll, we'll get to work more. Oh, yeah, hopefully we're challenging you enough. Oh, there's some challenges there, and that's fine. I'd like a good challenge. You're not going to be bored. Joe has been very instrumental and very helpful um, in uh, doing working with on some of the issues of the facilities master plan that I chair. We've been spending a lot of quality time together, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and other issues. It's a great team. Our condolences, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm very pleased with the team. I have here. I'm sorry to see Mark uh, retiring. I understand, you know, sometimes it's you know, the thing to do, but um, I am pleased with the staff I have and I, I uh, look forward to working with each and every one of them going forward. Great. Any, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. At the end of our agenda, because I don't know we have. Oh, that's great. Do we, do we have any other discussion that we want to have while we have the, both the finance and select board assembled? I will just note to you, Madam Chair, that we will reconvene the budget hearings on Monday, March 14th. Exact time to be confirmed, but between 7 and 7.30 p.m. All right. And these were great. Even though we talked a lot and had a lot of questions, but these were great presentations too. Yeah. Really concise to the point. Anything else? So should we um, we adjourn, not recess to reconvene. We're gonna do a motion to adjourn. So move. Uh, well we have to end the meeting somehow. I adjourn a motion to adjourn. Yeah, I'll second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor. Aye. Aye.